over driving like this. Ah! Is the man mad? What does he think he's doing? Hey, what does he think he's doing? You old fool. What do you want out the window ah! for? You rogue. Are you trying to kill us? Close the window and sit ah! down. Oh, I'm stuck. I can't move it. Here, let me help. <sighs> oh, I swear to God. I'll never travel by coach again. We'll soon be in Bob, man. Dirtiest night I ever remember. Oh, he was a fool to come out on these November roads. No. Are you getting down at Bob, my dear? No, I'm travelling on. To Lanston? Not so far. To Jamaica in. Jamaica? God bless us. Are you out of your mind, girl? Jamaica in? We present Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn. Jamaica Inn's no place for a girl. What would you be doing there? Oh, I've heard it's lonely enough, but that won't worry me. I've never lived in a town. Oh, where you come from, my dear? From Halford, oh. on the Halford River. My father owned a farm there. Oh. Oh, have a bit of cake in here somewhere. Would you like some? No, thank you. And what made you leave your father's farm then? My father died long ago. My mother ran it alone for 17 years. And then the bad times came. Same for all of us. Prices fall into nothing. No money anywhere. There was a sickness. It seemed to attack the very ground. The chickens died and the ducklings and the grey calf. And then May died. Was that your maid? We had to give up maids long since. May was our old mare, and when she died, the life seemed to go out of mother, too. The doctor said it was a stroke. Uh, this is what I've been afraid of, that she'd stop suddenly like this. Your mother has spared neither a mind nor a body since your father died, and she's broken down at last. But her pulse is regular, and her breathing steady. Now you must prove yourself your parents' child, Mary, and help her through this. You're the only one who can. I've no will to go on any longer, Mary. And I don't want you to waste your youth looking after me. I don't want you to struggle as I've done. It breaks the body and it breaks the spirit. There's no call for you to stay on at Alford after I'm gone. Tis best for you to go to your aunt Patience at Bodmin and see life in a fine town for a change. I'd be no use in a town. I've never known anything but life at Helford, and I don't want to. What would I do up at Bargmin with Aunt Patience? A girl can't live alone, Mary, without she goes queer in the head or comes to evil. Have you forgotten Lucy? Left an orphan at 16, she ran away to Falmouth and went with the sailors. I'm not likely to go off with sailors, Mother. I'd not rest in my grave if I didn't know you were safe. You like your Aunt Patience. She was always a great one for games and laughing, with a heart as large as life. You remember when she came here, 12 years back? She was as pretty as a fairy, with bright blue eyes and a silk petticoat. There was a fellow working at Trella Warren who had an eye to her, but she thought herself too good for him. And what about the man she did marry, Uncle Jasher? I know nothing of him. I've never set eyes on him, nor known anyone that has. They'd think me rough. I haven't the pretty manners they'd expect. We shouldn't have much to say to one another. Nonsense, child. You've had a sound education. You can speak well and you know your manners. Oh, you may lack for a few airs and graces, but they love you for yourself, child. I want you to promise me that when I'm gone, you'll write to you, Aunt Patience, and tell her it was my last and dearest wish that you should go to her. I promise, Mother. And when did your dear mother pass away, then? In October. What was left of the livestock was sold at Helston. A man from Coverack bought the farm. And now you're going to live with your aunt. Whatever could have brought her to Jamaica in? Dear Mary, you can well imagine that your letter came to me as a terrible shock. I had no idea that Faith was even ill. Seems so long since I was at Elston and we were all together. There have been changes with us you would not know about. We no longer live in Bodmin, but nearly 12 miles outside on the road to Lanson. I've asked your uncle, and he does not object, he says, if you're quiet-spoken and not a talker, and will give help when needed. 
He cannot give you money or feed you for nothing, as you will understand. He will expect your help in the bar in return for your board and lodging. You see, your uncle is the landlord of Jamaica Inn. Bad men at last. I never thought we'd live to see it. Are you sure you don't want to get down here and stop in Badman for the night? I'm quite sure. It'll be a wild drive across the moors tonight. You can go on in the morning. I can't wait till morning. They're expecting me. Oh, I'll bid you good night then. Good night. Uh, good night, my oh. dear. God bless you. Good night and thank you. You'll be going on to land soon then. A rough journey there tonight. Be none in the coach for you. Oh, I'm not afraid of the drive. And I'm not going as far as Lanson. Will you please put me down at Jamaica Inn? Jamaica Inn? What would you be doing at Jamaica Inn? You must have made a mistake, surely. I shall be all right. I'm going to relatives. My uncle is landlord of Jamaica Inn. I see. None of my business then. Why, what's the matter? Is my uncle not right? Jamaica's got a bad name. Queer tales get about. You know how it is. But I don't want to make any trouble. Maybe they're not true. What sort of tales? Do you mean there's much drunkenness there? Does my uncle encourage bad company? Yeah, I don't want to make trouble. I don't know anything. It's only what people say. Respectable folk don't go to Jamaica anymore. That's all I know. Well, why don't folk go there? What's the reason? They're afraid. Can I get you anything before we go on? It's a long drive before you. It's cold on the moors. No, nothing. It'll be all right. We'd best be going then. Uh, since you're the only traveller, you best have the other rugs. Thank you. I'll whip the horses on once we climb the hill out of Bodmin. I shan't be easy in my mind till I reach my bed in last. Well, come on, Master. to be seen anywhere now. Just miles and miles of barren moor. No trees, no cottages, nothing. Miles and miles of nothing, like a desert. No human being could live in this place and remain like other people. Their children would be born twisted and their minds would be twisted too. Everything must grow up twisted in all this marsh and rock and crumbling stone. We're coming to the top of the hill to some sort of building, standing all alone with tall chimneys. Can this really be Jamaica Inn? This dark, desolate place? We're here. There's no sign of a light anywhere. Is anyone there, do you think? <laughs> Let me help you down. Thank you. The door is across the yard there. If you hammer away, they'll be sure to let you in. I'll put your trunk down here. And if you get not, I'll not reach last in tonight. Good night! What a dreadful, desolate place. At least someone's noticed me. Who is it? What do you want here? I am... I am Mary Yellen. Come here. Let's have a look at you. So, you come to us after all. I'm your uncle, Josh Merlin. Welcome to Jamaica Inn. So, you're Mary Ellen, and you've come all this way to look after your uncle Josh. I call it very handsome of you. Where's my Aunt Patience? Is she not expecting me? Where's my Aunt Patience? Can't you wait an instant without running to her? Haven't you a kiss for your Uncle Joss? No, I haven't. I'm not going to touch you, Mary Ellen. You're as safe as a church with me. I never did like dark women, my dear. And I've better things to do than to play cat's cradle with my own niece. Patience! Patience! What in hell are you doing? Here's your little niece arrived, and she's whimpering after you. <laughs> she, she's sick of the sight of me already. Mary, have you really come? And patience. Oh, it is my niece, Mary Ellen, isn't it? My dad's sister's child. Yes, Aunt, it is. Oh! Oh, have patience. I I'm so glad to see you again. Oh. It's so many long years since you came to us at Helford. Oh, Mary, my dear. Mary. Stop all that. Oh. What sort of a welcome is this? What have you got to squawk about, you damn fool? Oh. Can't you see the girl starving? 
Get her out to the kitchen. <laughs> Give her some bacon and a drink. Oh, I'll take her trunk up to her room. And if you've not got a bite of supper on the table, by the time I'm down again, I'll give you something to cry about. Why, you... And you too, if you like, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Are you tame? Or do you bite? Come into the kitchen, my dear. You mustn't mind your Uncle Joss. He must be humoured, you know. He has his ways, and strangers don't understand him at first. He's a very good husband to me. Has been since our wedding day. I sit down by the fire, my dear. You must be cold and weary after such a long day. It has been a long day. You'll soon come to light your Uncle Joss and put him to his ways. He's a very fine man. Very fine man. He has a great name hereabouts and is much respected. There's no one will say a word against Joss Merlin. We have great company here at times, and it's not always as quiet as this. It's a very busy highway, you know. The coaches pass every day. And the gentry are most civil to us, most civil. And even the squire himself, that Squire Bassett, you know, from North Hill, he owns all the land thereabouts. He passed me on the road the other day, Tuesday it was, and he took off his hat. Good morning, madam, he said, and he bowed to me from his horse. Then out comes Joss from the stable where he's been mending the wheel of the trap. How's life, Mr. Bassett, he says. As large as yourself, Joss, answers the squire, and they both fell to laughing. So, <laughs> oh. the ends are clacking already. I heard you, you blathering fool, gobble, gobble, gobble like a turkey hen. Do you think your precious little niece believes a word you say? Why, you wouldn't take in a child, far less a bunch of petticoats like her. Eat up. You need food, I can see that. What'll you drink? Brandy, wine, or ale. Mm. You may starve here, but you won't go thirsty. We don't have dry throats at Jamaica. I'll have a cup of tea, if I may. I'm not used to drinking spirits, nor wine neither. Well, that's your loss, I'm glad to say. <laughs> you can have your tea tonight, but by God, you'll want some brandy in a month or two. Patience! Yes, just Fetch me a bottle of brandy! I've got a thirst. All the water in those Mary wooden slate. Brandy, yes, Joss. Ah, you have a pretty enough paw for a girl who's worked on a farm. I was afraid it would be rough and red. If there's one thing that makes a man sick, it's to have his ale poured out by an ugly hand. Not that my customers are over particular, but then, we've never had a barmaid before at Jamaica Inn. Have you served in a bar, Mary Ellen? No, Uncle. I wonder how you'll take to it. Here's your brandy, Joss. I'll tell you what it is, Mary Ellen. I'm master in this house, and I'll have you know it. You'll do as you're told, and help in the house, and serve my customers, and I'll not lay a finger on you. But by God, if you open your mouth and squawk, I'll break you until you eat out of my hand. <laughs> Same as your aunt yonder. I understand you. It doesn't matter to me what you do in the inn or what company you keep. I'll do my work about the house and you'll have no cause to grumble. But if you hurt my Aunt Patience in any way, I'll tell you this. I'll leave Jamaica in straight away and I'll find the magistrate and bring him here and have the law on you. And then try and break me if you like. <laughs> That's very pretty. Very prettily put indeed. Now we know just what sort of a lodger we have. Scratcher. And she shows her claws. <laughs> All right, my dear. You and I are more akin than I thought. I may have work for you at Jamaica in one day. Work that you've never done before. Man's work, Mary Ellen. Where you play with life and death. Oh, Joss. Oh, Joss, please. Go up to bed, patience. I'm tired of your death set at my supper table. This girl and I understand one another. Yes, Joss. Good night, Mary. Good night, Aunt Patience. I'll be up soon. You'll stay here and talk to me. There's one weakness in my life, and I'll tell you what it is. It's drink. 
I can't stop myself. One day, it'll be the end of me, and a good job too. There's days go by and I don't touch more than a drop, same as I've done tonight. And then I'll feel the thirst come on me, and I'll soak. Soak for hours. Oh, it's power and glory, and women and the kingdom of God all rolled into one. I feel a king then, Mary. I feel I got the strings of the world between my two fingers. It's heaven and hell. Oh, I talk then. Talk until every damn thing I've ever done is split to the four winds. I shut myself in my room. Your aunt turns the key on me. And when I'm sober, I hammer on the door and she lets me out. There's no one knows that but her and I. And now I've told you. I've told you because I'm already a little drunk and I can't hold my tongue. But I'm not drunk enough to lose my head. I'm not drunk enough to tell you why I live in this God-forgotten spot and why I'm the landlord of Jamaica Inn. But no one comes here. Oh, the coaches don't stop here now, nor the mails neither. Oh. I don't worry. I've customers enough. The wider berth the gentry give me, the better pleased I am. Oh, there's drinking here, all right, and plenty of it, too. There are nights when every cottage on the moor is dark and silent, and the only lights for miles are the blazing windows of Jamaica Inn. You'll be in the bar those nights, and if you've a fancy for it, you'll see what kind of company I keep. Yes, Uncle. They're all afraid of me. <laughs> the whole damn lot of them. Afraid of me? Who's afraid of no man? I tell you, Mary, if I'd had learning, I'd have walked the length of England beside King George himself. It's drink that's been against me. Drink and my hot blood. It's the curse of all of us, Mary. There's never been a Merlin yet that died peaceful in his bed. My father was hanged at Exeter. He killed a man in a brawl. My grandfather had his ears cut for thieving and died raving mad from a snake bite in a convict settlement. I'm the eldest of three brothers, all of us born under the shadow of Kilmar, away yonder above twelve men's moor, great crag of granite like a devil's hand sticking up into the sky. If you'd been born under its shadow, you'd take a drink, same as I did. And my brother Matthew, he was drowned in Trawatha Marsh. We thought he was he was gone as a sailor. <laughs> but last summer, there was a drought and no rain fell for seven months. And there was Matthew, sticking up in the bog with the curlews flying round his head. <sighs> my brother Jim Daniel. He was the babby, hanging on to mother's skirts when Matt and I were grown men. I never did see eye to eye with Jem. Too smart he is, too sharp with his tongue. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, they'll catch him in time and hang him, same as they did my father. Do you want me to pour you a glass of brandy? Open to loose my tongue some more, are you, Mary? No. Ah. I'll have no more tonight. Go to bed before I wring your neck. Here's your candle. Where's my room? At the top of the stairs over the porch. See you here. There'll be nights when you hear wheels on the road, and those wheels will not pass by, but they'll stop outside Jamaica Inn. And you'll hear footsteps on the road and voices beneath your window. When it happens, You'll stay in your bed and cover your head with the blankets. Do you understand? Yes, Uncle. Very well. And remember, if you ever ask me a question, I'll break every bone in your body. Now get out. <laughs> Aunt Patience. 
What are you doing, child? You mustn't come in here. I heard you crying. It's nothing, Mary. Nothing for you to concern yourself with. Have you been into your room? Yes, I have. I'm afraid it's not very comfortable for you. Sheets aren't quite dry. It rained all day, you say. I'll sleep in my cloak. There is no jug and basin. Where do I wash? In the kitchen. We're not used to guests at Jimmy Kim. What's that? Oh, it's just the old inside swing in the wind. It sounds like an animal in pain. You get used to it, Mary. Everything here is strange at first. <gasps> He's coming to bed. He mustn't find you here. Go to your room quickly. Please, Mary. Good night, Aunt Patience. <laughs> Like a body swinging on a gibbet. Jamaica in. Jamaica in. Could I get away from the place tonight once they're asleep? Twelve miles across the moor to Bagman. If I'm to go, it must be this night. If I stay here any longer, all my courage will go from me. I'll end up mad and broken like poor Aunt Patience. Drop that sniveling! There! There, you got someone else! What's the Snivel use? Again? I can't run out into the night and leave her here to the mercy of that brute. Whatever I may have to face here, I must stay and give what help I can to Aunt Patience. Mother wouldn't have run away because she was afraid of a man who was half crazed. She'd have stayed and fought. And I must stay and fight too. So, this is where you got to. I thought you'd gone away and left us. I got up early. The air's so cold and sweet smelling, and the water's so clear. It tastes of pee. Where's Uncle Jas gone? Oh, he went out early. I don't know where he's gone. Sometimes he's away for days. Aunt Patience, why is he the landlord of Jamaica Inn? Oh, what a funny question, child. The inn's a very prominent place here. This is the main road from the south. Coaches pass here twice a week. But why don't they stop here? Oh, they do. Uh, they often ask for a drink in the bar. We've good custom here. How can you say that? I had a look round the place this morning after I heard Uncle leave. The parlour looks as if it's never used. The guest rooms are stored with lumber fit only for rats and mice. Well, your Uncle Joss doesn't encourage folk to stay. He says you never know who you're going to get. Why, in a lonely spot like this, we might be murdered in our beds. There's all sorts on a road like this. Wouldn't be safe. That's nonsense, Aunt Patience. What is the use of an inn that can't give an honest traveller a bed for the night? That's what an inn's for, surely. And how do you live if you have no custom? Oh, we do have custom, I've told you that. The men come in from the farms and places round about. There are evenings when the bar is full of them. The driver on the coach last night told me respectable people don't come to Jamaica anymore. He said they were afraid. Your Uncle Joss has a strong temper. You've seen that for yourself. He's easily roused. He will not have folk interfering with him. Why should anyone interfere with a landlord who's going about his rightful business? Um, patience, why did you come here in the first place? Mother had no idea you were living here. We thought you were in Badman. I met your uncle in Badman, but we never lived there. We lived near Padstow for a while, and then we came here. Your uncle bought the inn from Squire Bassett. It stood empty for a number of years, I believe, and your uncle decided it would suit him. He wanted to settle down. He's travelled a lot in his time. He's been to more places than I can remember names. I believe he was in America once. Why did he settle here? It's near his old home. And his brother lives not far away on Twelve Men's Moor, when he's not roaming the country. He comes here sometimes, but your uncle just does not care for him much. And this Mr Bassett, does he ever visit the inn? N no. Why not? There was some misunderstanding. Your uncle bought it through a friend. Mr Bassett did not know who Uncle Joss was until we settled in, and then he was not very pleased. Why was that? He'd not seen your uncle since he lived at Trawatha as a young man. Your uncle was wild when he was a lad. Got a name for acting rough. It wasn't his fault, Mary. It was his misfortune. Merlins were all wild. His young brother Jem is much worse than your uncle ever was, I'm sure of that. But Mr. Bassett listened to a pack of lies about Uncle Joss. And he was in a great way when he discovered he'd sold Jamaica to him. That's all there is to it. Aunt Patience, I want you to come into the house with me. I want to show you something. Whatever is it, child. 
The room at the end of this passage is barred shut. I noticed it when I was taking a look round. Well, what about it? Uncle Joss told me about wheels that stop outside Jamaica in at night. What has this door to do with it? Don't. Don't ask me that. You mustn't ask me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure it's none of my business. I've no right to question you like this. Please, forget what I said. Forget all about it. I'm sorry. Mary. Mary, I can't answer your question. For this many, I don't know the answer of myself. But because you're my own sister's child, I, I must give you a word of warning. There's things happen at Jamaica, Mary, that I've never dared to breathe. Bad things. Evil things I can't never tell you. Some of it in time you'll come to know you can't avoid it living here. I'm um, patient. Your uncle mixes with strange men who follow a strange trade. Sometimes they come by night. From your window you'll hear footsteps and knocking at the door. Your uncle lets them in, brings them to this room here. They go inside. From my bedroom above, I can hear the mutter of their voices through the long hours. Before dawn, they're away. No sign left that they've ever been. When they come, you must not question me. Not him, nor anyone. For if you came to guess but half of what I know, your hair would go grey, Mary, as mine is done. And you would tremble in your speech and weep by night. And all that lovely, careless youth of yours would die, Mary, as mine has died. Oh, this is a terrible place. It's as if I were looking at the world in another age. An age where man did not exist. Man seems to have no place here at any rate. The creatures that seem to belong here are the ravens and the buzzards. A crag like a split hand. That must be Kilmartor. A devil's hand, Jas Merlin called it. Somewhere in this wilderness of stone he was born. And his brother lives here still. I can well believe that anyone born in the shadow of Kilmartor will come to no good. And down there is the marsh where Matthew Merlin went to his death. What a terrible way to die. To be remorselessly sucked under the bark until the weeds and slime close over your head. Oh, this is a terrible place. Time to go back. If I'm to be at Jamaica Inn before dusk. pretty little niece is back from her walk. You don't look very pleased to see me. Did you miss me much? I didn't know that you were coming back today. Did you have a pleasant journey? Pleasant be damned. There was money in it and that's all I care about. I've not been staying in the palace with a king if that's what you mean. I must go up to my room. I'm not stopping you. There's no skulking up there this evening. Don't you know what day of the week it is? I've lost count of time. It must be... It's Saturday. Saturday. And we'll be having company at the inn tonight. You'll be working in the bar alongside your uncle. It'll be quite a surprise for the regulars, I shouldn't wonder. This is mine, boys. I was the first to clap eyes on her. Now, don't go hiding away, my dear. Come out here and let's see what you're made of. She stays this side of the bar with me tonight, and you'll keep your filthy hands off her. Keeping her for yourself, are you, Josh? Who is she, then? What's your name, sweetheart? She's my niece, that's who she is. She's come as a serving maid to my wife, and you'll leave her alone if you know what's good for you. Sorry, Josh, no offense, man. She's your property. That's enough for us. <laughs> oh, it's too quiet in here tonight. Give us a shot. Always ready to oblige good company. One day I and Tate men walk. 
to the square he then strutted his toes, he sat down, he looked all about him and swelling with pride, he told one and all, I have come for a bride. He told one and all, I have come for a bride. Would you like to know who our brave company are, Mary? The little fella who had his eye on you and is now singing so prettily is Harry the Peddler. He used to work in a mine near Red Roof. It's in ruins now, so he took to the road as a peddler and tinker. He's picked up a store of filthy songs on the road. The man in the corner, biting his nails, is a fisherman from Port Isaac. Rumor has it that he's got a hoard of gold wrapped up in a stocking, but we've not seen the color of it yet. You see the fat man with his face and his beard. He was a shepherd once. He fired his master's ricks and went into hiding near the cheese ring. And a man with a patch over his eyes, a crooked horse dealer, who was handed out of Devon. A friend of my worthy brother, I shouldn't wonder. And as to the rest, they're vagrants, poachers, thieves and gypsies. How do you fancy my company? They're foul and they stink. Who's the poor soul with the purple birthmark all across his face? Him? That's the idiot boy from Dozemary. <laughs> They'll have some sport with him presently. I feel sick. Sick with the smell and sight of them. <laughs> Harry! The idiot won't join you in your song. Oh, oh what's the meaning? I think he needed music. Stick him up on the table, lad. Like <laughs> Let's have a sample of your sweet voice. <laughs> Sing out after me. He soon found a widow and fast they were wed. I can't stand any more of this. You'll have to attend to your friends yourself. Had enough of it, I'm here. Think yourself a little bit too good for such as we. I'm going upstairs to my room. Listen to me, Mary. You've had an easy time behind the bar, and you ought to go down on your knees and thank me for it. Because you're my niece. They've let you alone with you. But if you hadn't had that honor, by God, there wouldn't be much of you now. Well, get out then. It's close on midnight anyway, and I don't want you here. You lock your door tonight, Mary, and pull down your blinds. And mind this. <laughs> you're breaking my arm! Keep your mouth shut, and I'll treat you like a lamb. You don't do to be curious at Jamaica Inn, and I'll have you remember that. <laughs> now, go upstairs to bed, Unless hear no more of you tonight, or I'll break you, mind and body. Yes, Uncle, I'm going. Strip that damn idiot of his clothes and send him naked back with you. <laughs> They're worse than wild beasts. This'll make you skip. Try to shut it out. Shut it out of your brain. Bury your head under the blanket like I'm patience. That'll do. Back up near the door. Oh, that's enough. The wheels that stop outside Jamaica Inn. But I'll not lie here with my head under the blankets. Will they see me if I pull the blind up? Come on, look lively now. Let's have those casts off the wagon. Right away, Jack. Shall we throw a cloth for the horses, Jack? They've had a hard journey from the coast and they're steaming in the cold. Not worth the trouble, Harry. They'll be on their way again soon enough. Can't you move any faster? You want the revenue men to catch us on the road with this lot? Yeah. Put your backs into it, for God's sake. They must be smuggled goods they're unloading. That's the way. And the inn must be a storehouse where they hide them. That's the lot, Joss. On your way, then. Then Joss Merlin must be the brains behind it all. I'll send you word when to come again. That's why he's the landlord of Jamaica Inn. It's got nothing to do with his childhood memories. He took the inn because it's on the main road to the coast. And now we've got business to settle. It's late, Merlin. We'll talk tomorrow. We'll talk tonight.
Bring him inside, Harry. Leave him to me, Jas. I must go down and find out what they mean to do. Harry, have patience. What do you think you're doing out here, Joy? Don't you mind about me? Take your hands off me. I'm not going to run away. Uncle Jas is bringing someone into the inn. I want to find out what's happening. Come on, keep moving. Mary. Mary, go back to your room. It's no concern of yours. Keep going. Into the back. I believe it is, and I'm going to find out. You know what he's like. He'll kill you if he finds you spying on him. He'll not find me. Go back to your room and hide your head. Go now. Oh, don't let him see you. No good will come of this. So what's it to be? I want a clear answer, mate. You're more shifted and changing at every wind. Tell us. I've given you my answer. It's no. I'll not be a party to it. I'll break with you now and forever, and there's an end to our agreement. What you're asking me to do is nothing short of murder, and there's no other name for it. It's common murder. So, our fancy little lawyer's lost his nerve, has he? Doesn't think the job's worth swinging for. Swinging? I've risked swinging before, and I'm not afraid of my neck. I'm thinking of my conscience and almighty God. I'd face any man in a fair fight, but when it comes to the killing of innocent folk, and maybe women and children among them, that's going straight to hell, Joss Merlin. And you know that as well as I do. Not so fast, my friend. You're soaked in this business up to your neck. And be damned to your blasted conscience. There's no going back on it now. It's too late for you and for all of us. I've been doubtful about you from the first with your gentleman's airs and your clean cuffs. And by God, I've proved myself right. So what do you propose to do? Propose to do? Harry! Bolt the door to the yard and put the bar across. Right away, Joss. You can't do this. You're not going anywhere. Let me go. Shall we tickle him up like silly Sam? He'd be a little body without his fine clothes. I could do with his watch and chain too. Tickle him with a whip, Joss, and let's see the colour of his skin. Shut your mouth, Harry. Stand by the door. Prick him with your knife if he tries to get out. I'll do that, Joss. Now look here, Mr. Lawyer Clark, or whatever you are in Truro Town... You've made a fool of yourself tonight, but you're not going to make a fool of me. You'd like to walk out of that door, wouldn't you, and get on your horse and be away to Bodman to lay information about me before the magistrate. That's your fine idea, isn't it? Do your devil's work if you must. I can't stop you, and I give my word I won't inform against you. But join you, I will not. And there's my last word to you both. Last word, is it? Have a care, Master Lawyer Clark. I heard another man say that once. And five minutes later, he was treading the air on the end of a rope, my friend. And his big toe missed the floor by half an inch. I asked him if he liked to be so near the ground. But he didn't answer. The rope forced the tongue out of his mouth and he bit it clean in half. For God's sake, Merlin. I swear to you, I won't tell anyone. You won't have the chance. Sling that rope through the oak up there, Harry. <laughs> We've seen him dance, eh, Joss? I've got to get help. I can't let this happen. Now, get up on that chair, my friend. Merlin, for God's sake! Go on, or you'll get this knife in your guts. <laughs> now, Harry, hang the rope round his neck. No! No! Tie his hands behind his back. There's a cottage out on Dosmery Road, but I wouldn't stand the chance. And now, Mr. Lawyer Clark... I'm going to leave you to think about whether you're for us or against us. Come with me, Harry. Right here, Joss. I can settle this business by myself now, Harry. Take his horse and ride off as fast as you can. Cast him loose somewhere, the other side of Camelford. On your way now. Right away, Joss. I've left my door unlocked. If he goes in and finds I'm not there, he'll... He's come to the old guest room. I'm sorry, but you'll have to come down and see for yourself. There's somebody in there. Somebody who must have been there since early evening. It must be someone he didn't want the peddler to know about. That's why he sent him away with the horse. He swears he won't betray us. But how can we trust him? If we turn him loose, he could have the whole country about our heels. It's for you to say now. It's your responsibility now. It's for you to say the word. He could have heard every word Aunt Patience and I said on the landing. But if he knows I'm down here, he'd have told Uncle, and they'd have come looking for me. 
they've got enough on their hands with the man in the bar. <laughs> oh my God, was that a cry or am I imagining things? There's not a sound, nor a sign of a light anywhere. If I were to creep up and look through the keyhole of the door into the bar... Nothing. No one. The door to the yard's wide open. They must have gone out onto the moor. And the rope still swinging backwards and forwards. Backwards and forwards. God have mercy upon us. Mary Ellen? Mary Ellen! Come here! I want to talk to you. Yes, Uncle. What is it? You look tired and pasty-faced. What's the matter with you? Does the air not suit you here? Are you not sleeping? I'm well enough. I've decided you're not cut out to be a barmaid. Too much a fine lady for the customers at Jamaica Inn. Yes, Uncle. So... We better see what else we can do with you. Patience! Yes, Joss? Bring that barrow over here. Yes, Joss. What did you do with yourself down at Alston? Did you work on the farm? Or did you sit by the fire with your sewing? I did whatever had to be done. I looked after the geese and the hens, milked the cows, worked in the garden. I wasn't afraid of hard work. Did you know? Perhaps you might do the same at Jamaica. What do you say, Patience? Shall we have chickens and a cow? That would be nice, Joss. Your precious niece could look after him. It would give her something to do. And we'd all grow fat on the proceeds. Yes, Joss. Quite a pretty picture. Will that be all, Uncle? Will that be all, Uncle? Why, have you got better things to do than talk to your Uncle Joss? I'm giving the floors a good scrub down. Oh, not clean enough for you, are we? <laughs> Go on, then. It's many a year since they've seen soap and water. Off you go. Yes, Uncle. And don't you go snooping around. He behaves as if nothing had ever happened. As if Jamaica Inn were a normal place where people live normal lives. Digging their garden and talking about cows and chickens. But five days ago, he killed a man in cold blood. And buried his body somewhere out on the moors. Or did none of it really happen at all? Was it just a terrible nightmare? Hello? Is there anyone alive in this blasted place? Joss! Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, this is an inn, isn't it? How did you get in? The door was open. What do you think you're doing? You haven't any right to walk in here and help yourself to a glass of ale. Besides, the landlord doesn't encourage strangers. Since when have they kept a barmaid at Jamaica Inn? Well, you can refill my glass. I was thirsty. And do you have any tobacco for my pipe? Damn you and damn your pipe! <laughs> that was a perfectly good pipe! Is this how they teach you to serve customers? Well, I don't think much of their choice. There are better man of maids at Lanston where I was yesterday. I'm prettier into the bargain. What have you been doing with yourself? Your hair is all coming down at the back and your face is none too clean. That's no concern of yours. Fill up my glass. That's what we're here for, isn't it? I've ridden 12 miles since breakfast and I'm thirsty. You may have ridden 50 miles for all I care. As you seem to know your way about here, you can fill your own glass. <laughs> I'll tell Mr. Merlin you're in the bar, and he can serve you himself if he has the mind. Oh, don't go worrying, Joss. He'll be like a bear with a sore head at this time of day. Besides, he's never too eager to see me. I can believe that. What's she done with his wife? Has he turned her out to make room for you? Oh, the poor old soul. Well, you'll never stay with him ten years anyway. You can walk out of the door and turn to your left, and you'll come to the patch of garden and the chicken run. That's where they both were a few minutes ago. You can't come through this way because I've just washed the passage and I don't want you dirtying it with your muddy boots. Oh, don't get excited. There's plenty of time. Do you want to speak to the landlord or not? Because I can't stand here all day awaiting your pleasure. 
If you don't want to see him and you've finished your drink, you can put down your money on the counter and go away where you came from. <laughs> do you want to joss about like this? Well, he must be a changed man if you do. Ah. I never thought he'd run a young woman alongside of everything else. What do you do with poor patients of an evening, eh? Do you turn her out on the floor or do you sleep three abreast? Joss Merlin is my uncle by marriage. Aunt Patience was my mother's only sister. My name is Mary Yellen, if that means anything to you. Good day. There's the door behind you. Who the devil are you talking to in there? I thought I'd warn you to keep your mouth shut. Oh. It's you. It's all right, Joss. Don't beat the poor girl. She's broken my pipe and refused to serve me. Well, that sounds like your training, doesn't it? Well, come over here, brother of mine. Let's have a look at you. I'm hoping this maid has done you some good. What do you want at Jamaica Inn today, Jim? I can't buy an horse from you, if that's what you're after. You're not needed here, Mary. Go back to your scrubbing. <sighs> so that's Jim Merlin. All the time he was speaking, I knew he reminded me of someone, but I couldn't place it. He's got Joss's eyes and mouth. Joss must have looked like that 20 years ago. <laughs> what a vile breed they are! They mean their insults and their costness to hurt. They're rough and brutal. Jem's got the same streak of cruelty as his brother. You can see it in his mouth. Aunt Patience said he was much worse than Joss. Oh... There's no going against bad blood, my mother always used to say. It always comes out in the end. You may fight against it as much as you like, but it will have the better of you. Mary Ellen! What is it? Come out into the yard. I want to talk to you. What is it? Forgive me if I was rude to you just now. Somehow I didn't expect to see a woman at Jamaica Inn. Not a young girl like you, anyway. I thought Joss had found you in one of the towns and brought you here for his fancy lady. There's nothing fancy about me. I'd look well in a town, wouldn't I, in my old apron and heavy shoes? I should have thought anyone with eyes in his head could see I wasn't town bred. Oh, I don't know, Mary Ellen. Put you in a fine gown, a pair of high-heeled shoes and stick a comb in your hair, I dare say you'd pass for a lady. Even in a fine place like Exeter. I meant to be flattered by that, I suppose. <laughs> but thanking you very much, I'd rather wear my old clothes and look like myself. Oh, you could do a lot worse than that, of course. I've work to do inside. Oh, don't go, Mary. I know I deserve black looks for speaking to you as I did. But if you knew my brother as well as I do, you'd understand me making the mistake. Why did you come here in the first place? I came here to be with my aunt Patience. My mother died some months ago and I have no other relative. I'll tell you one thing, Mr Merlin. I'm thankful my mother isn't alive to see her sister now. Oh, I don't suppose marriage with Joss is a bed of roses. What did she marry him for? He's been the same as long as I can remember. He used to thrash me when I was a lad. And he'd do the same today if he dared. I suppose she was misled by his bright eyes. Aunt Patience was always the butterfly down in Elford, my mother used to say. She wouldn't have the farmer who asked her, but took herself off up country where she met your brother. That was the worst day of her life. You've not much opinion of the landlord, then? No, I have not. He's a bully and a brute and many worse things beside. He's turned my aunt from a laughing, happy woman into a miserable drudge. And I'll never forgive him for that as long as I live. We Merlins had never been good to our women. I can remember my father beating my mother until she couldn't stand. She never left him, though. Stood by him all his life. When he was hanged at Exeter, she didn't speak to a soul for three months. Her hair went white with a shock. I can't remember my grandmother, but they say she fought side by side with Grandad once near Callington. When the soldiers came to take him, she bit a fellow's finger right through to the bone. What she had to love in Grandad, though, I don't know. For he never so much as asked for her after he'd been taken. And he left all his savings to another woman the other side of the Tamar. Aunt Patience wouldn't have that kind of courage. But I know she'd never leave him. How long do you mean to stay at Jamaica, Mary Ellen? There's not much company for a maid like you here. I can't help that. I'm not going unless I can take my aunt with me. I'd never leave her here alone. Not after what I've seen. And just what have you seen? It's quiet enough here in all conscience. 
I helped my uncle in the bar one night, and I didn't think much of the company he kept. <laughs> I don't suppose you did. The fellows who come to Jamaica have never been taught manners. They spent too much time in the county jail. I wonder they're ever outside it. I wonder what they thought of you. Made the same mistake as me, most likely. And are now spreading your fame far and wide about the countryside. I dare say you'll have Joss throwing the dice for you the next time they come to Jamaica. And when he loses, you'll find yourself riding pillion behind a dirty poacher from the other side of Row Tour. There's little chance of that. They'd have to knock me senseless before I roll pillion with anyone. Senseless or conscious. Women are pretty much the same when you come to it. You've a high opinion of us, evidently. The poachers on Bodmin wouldn't know the difference anyway. What do you do for a living? I'm a horse thief. Ah, but well, there's not much money in it. My pockets are always empty. I could get you a horse. No, thanks. I've got a little pony that would suit you handsomely, Mary. He's over at Chihuahua now. Why don't you come back with me and have a look at him? Aren't you afraid of being caught? Well, thieving's an awkward thing to prove. Supposing a pony strays from his pen and his owner goes to look for him. Well, you've seen for yourself. The moors are alive with wild horses and cattle. It's not going to be so easy for that owner to find his pony. And say the pony had a long white mane and one white foot with a diamond mark in his ear. Well, that narrows the field down a bit, doesn't it? And off goes the owner to Lanston Fair with his eyes wide open. But he doesn't find his pony. Mark you, the pony is there right enough. Only his mane is clipped, his four feet are all the same colour, and the mark on his ear is a slip, not a diamond. The owner doesn't even look at him twice, and the pony is bought by some dealer and sold away up country. That's simple enough, isn't it? So simple that I can't understand why you don't ride in your own coach with powdered footmen on the step. <laughs> well, uh, there you are. I've never had the brain for figures, and money just slips through my fingers. Last week, I had ten pounds in my pocket. Today, I've only a shilling piece. That's why I want you to buy that little pony. I can't spend my savings on horses. I'm laying aside for my old age, and if I ever get away from Jamaica in, I shall need every penny. You can depend on that. Look, Mary, I'm serious now. For forget all the nonsense I've been talking. Jamaica in is no place for a maid. My brother and I have never been friends, and I can say what I like about him. We go our own ways and be damned to one another. But there's no reason for you should be caught in his dirty schemes. Why don't you run away, eh? I'll see you on the road to Bodmin. I don't need you, Jem Merlin. I can look after myself. If that's where it is, I won't worry you. Come boy. My cottage is across the Withy Brook, if you ever want me. The other side of Truatha Marsh, at the foot of Twelve Men's Moor. At any rate, I shall be there until the spring comes. Good day to you. And he rides away with a song on his lips choosing his own road. Jem Merlin. When all is said and done, he's no more than a common horse thief. No better than Harry the Peddler or the rest of them. For all that, he speaks well and has a charming smile. <sighs> There's bad blood in him, Mary, and he breaks the law every day of his life. He's just Merlin's brother. There's no escaping that. He's not a man you can trust. Mary Allen, what are you doing hanging about here? Come inside. Your aunt needs you in the kitchen. Now you'll bide in your room tonight, Mary Allen, and you'll pull down the blind and put your head under the blankets. And you'll hear and see nothing. You understand? Give me a hand with this one. Where's the tar? Easy, does it? No. Lift. You go any faster. We not got all night. We're getting on as quick as we can. This stuff's heavy. I won't be long now. The swagon's nearly loaded. Oh, they look like ghosts in the grey light out there. They must use the inn as a store for a week or two, and then carry the goods down to the Tamar Bank when the time is right. So that's why Jem Merlin came to the inn this morning. He said he'd been to Lanston, and Lanston's on the Tamar. He must have come to warn Joss to expect the wagons tonight. Are they in league together, despite what they say? 
That's why Jim was asking so many questions to find out how much I knew. He's in it as thick as his brother. That must be why he told me to get away from the inn. And to think I hoped I might confide in him. Now I know I can trust no one. It's a wretched, damnable business without a ray of hope in any direction. The very walls of this place smell of deceit and death. On your way, I won't be defeated, and I won't be broken. I must bide my time and wait my opportunity to break the evil that is Jamaica in. In part one of Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, Mary Yellen was played by Susanna Corbett and Joss Merlin by John Woodbine. Aunt Patience, Oriel Smith, Jem Merlin, Mark Straker, Harry the Peddler, John Hartley, Mrs. Yellen, Joanna Wake, the Doctor, Eric Allen, the Lawyer Clerk, Robert Portal, the Idiot, Alan Barker, the Coach Driver and his Passengers, John Church, Anne Windsor, and Ronald Herdman. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Jamaica Inn was dramatized for radio by Michael Bakewell and directed by Enid Williams. I had come to Jamaica Inn after my mother's death to live with my Aunt Patience and her husband, Joss Merlin. I soon discovered that the inn was the centre of a smuggling ring and that my uncle was its leader. We present Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn. Is there anyone there? Sake, what is it? The door! They're at the door! I can't understand what you're saying. Who's at the door? It's Squire Bassett from North Hill. I saw him from the parlour window. He's come on horseback and another man with him. Oh, my dear, my dear, what are we going to do? Oh, why has he come here? He's always kept away before. He's heard something, Mary. I know he has. We shall have to let him in or he'll break down the door. What are we going to do? What are we going to say to him? There is no need for us to say anything at all. Tell him Uncle Joss is away from home and you know nothing. I'll come with you. Oh, Mary, if Mr. Bassett asks you what you know, you won't answer him, will you? I can trust you, can I? Yes, Aunt, you can trust me. You'll not tell him of the wagons. If any danger came to Joss, I'd kill myself, Mary. I'll tell him nothing. You needn't be afraid of that. But come with me to the door. We can't keep him waiting any longer. You take your time here, don't you? Is this a kind of welcome you keep for travellers? Is the landlord at home? Mr. Merlin is from home, sir. Are you in need of refreshment? I will serve you if you'll go through to the bar. Refreshment be damned. I know better than to come to Jamaica Inn for that. I want to speak to your master. As I said, sir, he is away. You there? Are you the landlord's wife? Yes, I am Mrs. Merlin. And when do you expect him home? If you please, Mr. Bassett, my husband went out as soon as he'd had his breakfast. And whether he will be back by nightfall, I really cannot say. That's a damn nuisance. I wanted a word or two with Joss Merlin. Your precious husband may have bought Jamaica in behind my back in his blackguardly fashion, and we're not going to that again now. But there's one thing I won't stand for, and that's having all my land hereabouts made a byword for everything that's damnable and dishonest round the countryside. I'm sure I don't know what you mean, Mr. Bassett. We live very quietly here at Jamaica Inn. My niece here will tell you don't the same. Don't take me for a fool, ma'am. I've had my eyes on this place for a long time. A house doesn't get a bad name without a reason, Mrs. Merlin, and Jamaica Inn stinks from here to the coast. Now then, are you going to invite me in? Well, sir, I'm sure that my husband... I can tell you it's useless to refuse me. I'm a magistrate and I have a warrant to search this place. Richards! Brother! Tie up the horses and see if you can find an old spike or crowbar in the stables. Come in with us when you've done so. Yes, Mr. Bassett. 
Mr. Basser, wouldn't it be better to wait? Get him in, Aunt. If we try to stop him now, we shall only anger him the more. Good God. The place smells like a tomb. What in the world have you done here? Jamaica Inn was always rough, cast and plain, but this is a positive disgrace. The house is bare as a board. There's not a stick of furniture anywhere. Don't you have any self-respect, woman? <laughs> what room do you call this? It's the parlor, Mr. Bassett. Stinks like a dog kennel. Don't you see the damp on the walls? If you don't put a stop to it, you'll have the roof about your ears. I've never seen anything like it. You're letting the place fall into ruin. I'll take a look upstairs. I may as well know the worst. What am I to do, Mary? What am I to say if he wants to look into the boardroom? Say nothing. What can you say? And try not to tremble so anyone can see you've something to hide. Your only chance is to pretend that you don't mind and that he can see anything in the house for all you care. Call this an inn? You haven't even a bed to sleep a cat. The place is rotten. Rotten right through. What have you to say for yourself? <laughs> the landlord's lady appears to have been stricken deaf and dumb. What about you, young woman? Have you nothing to say? I don't come from these parts. I've only been here a little while. My mother died and I'm here to look after my aunt. She's not very strong. You can see that for yourself. She's nervous and easily upset. Now don't blame her. See what's become of this place. Now if you'll kindly take me to the room that has bars on the windows. I'll notice it from the yard and I'd like to see inside. Mr. Bassett, no one is allowed to... I'm very sorry, sir. But if you mean the old lumber room at the end of the passage, I'm afraid the door is locked. My uncle always keeps the key, and where he puts it, I don't know. A strange state of affairs. What about you, Mrs. Merlin? You must know where your husband keeps his key, surely? No, sir, I, I don't know. He's never told me. Well, then, we shall have to see what we can do ourselves. Richards? Yes, Mr. Bassett. I have found this. That ought to do the job. We'll have this door open in no time. Uh, no trouble at all, really. Give me a candle, one of you. I'll get one. Black as a pit in here. I don't imagine the windows have been open in years. There's your candle. Thanks. Now we shall see what treasures Mr. Merlin keeps in his fairy cave. <laughs> don't let him see you're afraid. <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. A pile of old empty sacks, a coil of rope, Dust, cobwebs, and rat droppings. So, Mrs. Merlin, your husband has won this time. There's not evidence in that room could hang a cat. You've been lucky. If I'd found what I'd expected to find in there, I'd have seen your husband in the county jail. Good day, ma'am. Good day, Mr. Bassett. Richards, get the horses. Yes, Mr. Bassett. Young woman. I'd be obliged if you'd walk with me to the door. If you wish, Mr. Bassett. Now listen to me, young woman. This aunt of yours may have lost her tongue and her senses with it. But you can understand plain English, I hope. You mean to tell me you know nothing of your uncle's business? Does nobody ever call here by night? I've never seen anyone. Have you ever looked in that barred room before today? No, never in my life. What does your uncle do when he's away from home? I don't know. Don't you think it's very peculiar to keep an inn on the King's Highway and then bolt and bar your door to every passerby? My uncle is a very peculiar man. He is indeed. In fact, he's so damn peculiar that half the people in this countryside won't sleep easy in their beds till he's hanged, like his father before him. You can tell him that from me. I will, Mr. Bassett. You've got a very close tongue, haven't you, young woman? I say what I have to say. Well, I don't envy you your Merlin relatives. Have you seen anything of your uncle's younger brother, Jem Merlin of Trewartha? No. He never comes here. They don't get on. I see. Well, that's all I want from you this morning. But be sure to tell Joss Merlin what I said to you. I'll burn his ass round his ears if he plays tricks like that again. Would you let him in? There was no stopping him. He had a magistrate's warrant. There's no such thing. He's no more right to walk into my house than any other man. So what did he do? 
Walked about the house. Said you were letting the place go to rack and ruin. That damn skulking bastard. He asked for the keys of the barred room. And when we couldn't tell him where they were, he forced the door. Well, I'll bet he was disappointed with what he found. He said that you'd won this time. And I'll win every time, damn and blast his eyes. Did he ask you questions? Who came here? What your business was? What was your answer? I told him that I knew nothing. Anything more? He particularly wished me to tell you that the people hereabouts won't sleep easy in their beds until you're hanged, like your father before you. By God, if I'd been here, I'd have sent him back to North Hill so as his own wife wouldn't recognise him. And if she did, she'd have no use for him again. Can I go now? You done well today, Mary, and I'll not forget it. You don't think I did it for you, do you? I don't give a damn why you did it. The result's the same. Now... Get me something to eat. I must go out again, and there's no time to be lost. He's not taking the pony. He's going out across the moors on foot towards Router. Oh, Bassett's visit has made him change his plans, and he's going out to give his orders. Now, if I can follow him, keep him in sight, I can learn something of his business. The longer I'm kept in ignorance, the less I'll be able to achieve. I just hope he hasn't got too long a start. lost all trace of him. He must have climbed up the tor. And if that's where he's gone, I must try and follow. <sighs> Nothing. Not a soul in the whole vast moor. Oh, for all I know, he might never have come this way at all. I'll never find him now. There's a mist rising, and it'll be night soon. I must get down as fast as I can. It's nearly dark, and God knows where I am. I can smell the dampness of the marshes. One false step, and I might be drawn down into them like Joss's brother. I can't go on much further. I'm wet through, my feet are bleeding. Starting to turn ice cold. For once in my life, I'd even welcome the sight of the chimneys of Jamaica Inn. Someone's coming. A horseman, riding fast, coming towards me out of the darkness. What is it? Who's there? Is someone in trouble? Please, can you help me? Oh, woman, what in the world are you doing out here? Can you put me on the right road? I'm tired and miles from home and hopelessly lost. Of course, I'll help you if I can. Where have you come from? I live at Jamaica Inn. Jamaica Inn? You've come a long way out of your road. I'm afraid you're on the other side of Hendra Down. I'm sorry. That means nothing to me. I I've never been this way before. Now, wait a minute. I'll get down. Oh, you poor soul. You're exhausted and you're soaking wet. Now, you're not fit to walk another step and what's more, I'm not going to let you. You shall come back and have supper with me and I'll take you back to Jamaica Inn. You... You were very kind. What's the matter? Why do you look at me like that? No reason. It's nothing I... Is it my face and my white hair? I'm what is called an albino. That is all. Nothing to be frightened of. Oh, uh, perhaps I should introduce myself. My name is Francis Davy, and I'm the vicar of Alton. And Come, you shall ride on my horse. Are you sure you've had enough to eat? Quite sure, thank you. Um, more tea? Oh, that'd be very kind. That picture by the window. Oh, uh, it's not worth your looking at. Did you paint it? No, I paint to amuse myself. I fear I have very little skill. It's a strange picture. All grey and black and no touch of sunshine. <sighs> it's Dasmary Pool, sure. Eh? I don't care for it. It was done in a hurry. Tell me, what were you doing wandering on the moor like that? I was following my uncle. I think I'm gone out of my mind like Aunt Patience. Hmm? It's so warm and peaceful here. It's like being in a different world. I've not been at Jamaica in much over a month, but it seems like 20 years. Night after night, I lie awake listening for the sound of the wagons. The first time they came, they smuggled goods to the inn, and a man was killed that night. A man was killed? You must think I'm raving mad. 
I shouldn't have told you. I just couldn't keep it to myself anymore. Well, no, no, don't be afraid. Your secret is safe with me. But you're very tired. Don't you think your imagination may be running away with you a little? And this is the 19th century after all. Hmm? Well, having gone so far, don't you think you'd better tell me the rest of your story? I've said too much already. Oh, come now. I've heard confession in my time, not here, but in Ireland and in Spain. Your story will not seem as strange to me as you think. No, I will try to tell you then. Mm. I'll begin at the end, with the night the man was killed. My uncle had asked me to serve in the bar. I believe you, of course. You haven't the face of a liar, and I doubt if you know the meaning of hysteria, but your story wouldn't go in a court of law. It's too much of a fairy tale. And another thing, it's a scandal and an outrage, but smuggling is rife all over the country, and half the magistrates do very well out of it. That shocks you, doesn't it? But there's one thing you can count on. Mr. Bassett's visit will have scared your uncle. Oh, I thought that was why he set up across the moor this afternoon. Mm, it's very likely your uncle will lie low for a time now. There were no more wagons coming to Jamaica in for a while. I think you can be certain of that. Is there no way, then, of bringing Joss Merlin to justice? Well, I could see Mr. Bassett, if you like, and put your story to him, but unless he can catch your uncle at work with the wagons in the yard, there's little chance of convicting him. Mm. And... Then again, you don't want your aunt to be implicated in the business, but I don't see how it could be avoided if it came to an arrest. And what about the man they murdered? Do you mean to say nothing can be done about that? Not unless his body is found, which is extremely unlikely. But it is quite possible that he was never killed at all. And forgive me, but don't you think you may have allowed your imagination to run away with you? All you saw was a length of rope. But... I heard Uncle threaten him. Isn't that enough? Oh, my dear child. People threaten one another every day of the year, but they don't hang for it. Now, listen to me. I'm your friend, hmm? and you can trust me. My advice is that you should play a waiting game. Keep a close watch on your uncle, and when the wagons come again, you can report at once to me. If you're ever worried or distressed in any way, remember... I'm always here. Now, that's a, a bargain between us, isn't it? Oh, it's a bargain. Thank you very much. <laughs> Put your stockings on again and your <laughs> shoes while I go and get the trap. I'm going to take you back to Jamaica Inn. But how am I going to get back in? I don't want to wake my uncle. Let me be the best judge of that when we get there. Come. Yeah! Do you always drive as fast as this? Fast! We can do better than this. That. Go on. You've been in the stable all day. Show the lady what she can do. Don't you feel the excitement of it? Driving fast through the night as if we were the only people in the world. I love these moors. You've had a bad introduction to them, of course, so you can't understand me. If you knew them as well as I do and had seen them in every mood, winter and summer, you'd love them too. They have a fascination unlike any other part of the country. I go back a long way in time. Sometimes, I think they are the survival of another age. The moors were the first things to be created. Afterwards came the forest and the valleys and the sea. Climb Rauta one morning before sunrise and listen to the wind in the stones where our druid ancestors made their sanctuaries. You'll know what I mean then. We're nearly there. You can see the chimneys of the inn against the sky. Whoa! Ah. Yeah. We'd best leave the cart here, under the lee of the bank. We'll walk the rest of the way. There's no sign of anyone. It's like a house of the dead. Wouldn't you like me to try the beer? It's bolted always. That's my room over the porch. I can scramble up there if you'll let me climb on your shoulder. <laughs> my window's open at the top. Once on the porch, it'll be easy enough. Don't slip on those slates. I won't let you do it. Oh, it's absurd. Is there no way of getting in? What about the back? The door of the bar will be bolted, and the kitchen, too. We can slip round, if you like, and make certain. There's a light in the kitchen. That means my uncle's there. Aunt Patience always goes to bed early. There are no curtains to the window. If we pass by, he'll see us. Very well. 
I will take care he does not see me. I'm going to take a look in at the window. What a strange man. Well, he's not like any vicar I've ever known. Does he preach sermons about Rautor and the Moors being the first created then? You've nothing to worry about tonight, Mary Ellen. The landlord is sprawled at the table, dead drunk. He won't even see you, and the kitchen door is wide open. You can walk inside, go upstairs to bed. Good night to you, Mary Ellen. If you're ever in trouble and you need me, I shall be waiting for you. Why were you so late home last night? I lost my way on the moors. I came home by the road. I would have waited up for you, but when he's like this, it's best to leave him alone. Is there nothing we can do? Nothing. It was Squire Bassett's coming here that did it. He was very angry and upset, and he went off on the moors somewhere. When he came back early evening, he went straight for the bottle. Uh, uh, He'll be like this for days now. He'll wake in the evening, screaming for brandy and sobbing like a child. If I'm not here, give him a little brandy and water. He'll soon go to sleep again. Shouldn't we try to get him upstairs? No, he's best where he is. In the kitchen. And it's easier to care for him and to clean up the mess. Is he often like this? Used to be every six months or so he'd have one of his drinking bouts. They've grown more frequent of late. Seems now that anything can trigger it off. You mustn't distress yourself. I'm used to it. He's like a baby when he's like this. Why don't you get out in the fresh air while you have the chance? But take care you don't lose your way again. (sighs) Must be an hour since I left. So I've walked nearly four miles. And there's the hand of Kilmar Tor. Pointing his fingers to the sky. I can't keep Francis Davy out of my mind. He's a strange man with his white hair and pale eyes. Do they like him at Alternan? It'll be Christmas in a few days. Will he dress the church with Harley the way they used to at Helford? Mm. They'll be baking cakes and pastries at Helford now. There'll be no Christmas cheer at Jamaica Inn. There's a curlew. He's down there by the Trawatha Brook. Something's frightened him. Oh, it's a pony. Three ponies coming down to the stream to drink. And the man with them. Hello there. Mary Ellen. Hello. Jim Merlin. No point in trying to escape him. Where should I escape to in all this wilderness? So, you found your way to me at last. I didn't expect you so soon. Or I'd have baked bread in your honour. Would you now? (laughs) What would you have done if you hadn't found me at home? It's a long way to come for nothing. I didn't know you lived here. And I certainly never walked this way with the intention of finding you. I don't believe you. You started out with the hope of sighting me, and it's no good pretending any different. Well, you've come in time to cook my dinner. The fire's lit, and there's a bit of mutton in the kitchen. I, uh, I suppose you can cook. Do you always make use of folk this way? Well, I don't often have the chance. I've done all my own cooking since Mother died, and there's not been a woman around since. The cottage is down here. Come on, won't you? It's clear enough there hasn't been a woman here. The place is like a pigsty. Don't you ever do any cleaning? Don't have the time. Oh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Give me a bucket of water and find me a broom. I'll not eat my dinner in a place like this. It's not that bad. And you? Seat your ponies or whatever you do with yourself and leave me to get on with it. That smells good. And the whole place is clean as a pin. I shall have to keep a woman. Will you leave your hand at Jamaica Inn and come and look after me? You'd have to pay me too much. You'd never have enough money for what I'd ask. (laughs) Oh, make haste with the dinner. I'm empty as a worm. I can see that patience isn't one of your virtues. Take your hands away. The plate's hot. Mm. Not a word of thanks to me that's cooked it. Well, I certainly taught you something where you come from. I always say there's two things a woman ought to do by instinct, and cooking's one of them. 
Well, get me a jug of water, will you? You'll find a pitcher outside. I've poured you a cup already. Is there? Oh. Hmm. We are all of us born here, up in the room overhead. But Josh and Matt were grown men when I was a little lad, clinging to mother's skirts. How long has your mother been dead? Seven years this Christmas. What, with father hanged and Matt drowned in the marsh? Joss gone to America and me growing up as wild as a hork. She turned religious and used to pray her by the hour, calling on the Lord. Well, he couldn't abide it. I cleared out of it. Shipped out on a boat from Padstow for a time. But the sea didn't suit my stomach and I came back here to have my Christmas dinner. I found the place deserted and the door locked. I was mad. I hadn't eaten for 24 hours. I went over to North Hill and they told me my mother had died. She'd been buried three weeks. <laughs> I might just as well have stayed in Padstow for all the dinner I got that Christmas. There's a piece of cheese in the cup behind you. We'll eat half of it. There's maggots in it, but they won't hurt you. All right, I'll get it myself. Well, what's the matter with you? You look like a sick cow. It will be a good thing when there's not a Merlin left in Cornwall. It's better to have disease in a country than a family like yours. You and your brother were born twisted and evil. Do you never think of what your mother must have suffered? Mother was right. She never complained. She was used to us. Pass that jug. Have you finished? Yes. Then I'll clear. How's the landlord of Jamaica in? Drunk. Like his father before him. No, uh, drink will be the ruin of Joss. He soaks himself insensible and lays like a log for days. He'll lay there for a week if you let him. I'll let him. Then he'll come to, stagger on his feet like a newborn calf, with a mouth as black as Chuartha Marsh. That's when you want to watch him. He's dangerous then. You look out for yourself. He'll not touch me. I'll take good care of that. He's got other things to worry him. There's plenty to keep him busy. Don't be so mysterious. Nodding to yourself with your mouth all pursed up. Has anything been happening at Jamaica? It depends how you look at it. We had Squire Bassett over. The devil you did. And what had this squire to say to you? Uncle Joss was from home, and Mr Bassett insisted on coming into the inn and going through the rooms. He even broke into the barred storeroom, but he didn't find anything. He seemed quite disappointed. He asked after you as it happened. And what did you tell him? I said I'd never set eyes on you. <laughs> Why did you lie to him? Seemed less trouble at the time. If I'd thought longer, no doubt I'd have told him the truth. You got nothing to hide, have you? Well, nothing much. Except that black pony you saw by the brook belongs to him. He was dapple grey last week and worth a small fortune to the squire who bred him himself. Oh, I'll make a few pounds with him at Lance and if I'm lucky. Why don't you come out and have a look at him? trying to eat my cloak. Get away! Well, this is the fellow I wanted you to have. But you're so close with your money. He'd carry you well, too. The squire bred him for his wife. Are you sure you won't change your mind? You'd have me time up in the stable at Jamaica, I suppose. And when Mr Bassett calls again, you wouldn't be able to recognise him, would he? Thank you for your trouble, but I'll not risk it, all the same. <laughs> I've had enough from your family, Jem Merlin, for one lifetime. Well, you won't get a bargain like that again. He'll go to Lanston on Christmas Eve. The dealers will swallow him up. Well, get on with them. Go by. So, what did Squire Bassett expect to see at Jamaica Inn? You ought to know that better than I do. How much do you know? I didn't come here to answer questions. I had enough of that with Mr Bassett. Yeah, it was lucky for Josh the stuff had been shifted. I told him he was sailing too close to the wind. It's only a matter of time before they catch him. And all he does in self-defence is to get drunk, the damn fool. You must get a good view from the little window over the porch. Do they wake you out of your beauty sleep? How do you know that's my room? <laughs> well, the window was open when I rode into the yard the other morning, and there was a little bit of blind blowing in the wind. Well, I've never seen a window open at Jamaica Inn before. Why are you so silent about it all? Do you think I'm going to go to my brother and say, Here, that niece of yours, she lets her tongue run away with her? Oh, damn it, Mary, you're not blind nor deaf. Even a child could smell a rat if he lived a month at Jamaica Inn. What are you trying to make me tell you? And what does it matter how much I know? All I think about is getting my aunt away from the place as soon as possible. As for your brother, his life is his own, so is his business. So? 
The smuggling does not shock you, then. But suppose he's got involved in other things. Suppose it's a question of life and death, murder even. What then? What do you mean, life and death? You'll come to know if you stay long enough. What does your aunt look like a living ghost? Can you tell me that? Ask her the next time the wind blows from the northwest. I tell you this. There's going to be trouble between myself and Joss one day. And it's he that'll be sorry for it, and not I. It's time I was going. I've cleaned your cottage and cooked your dinner. What's the matter with you? It's early yet. Oh, I believe you're frightened of me. <sighs> you think I've got barrels of brandy and rolls of tobacco in the old bedrooms in there. You think I'm the worst of the Merlin pack, is that it? Something of the sort. But I'm not afraid of you. You needn't think that. Could even like you, if you didn't remind me so much of your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help my face. And I'm much better looking than Joss. You must allow me that. Oh, you've conceit enough to make up for the other qualities you lack. And I'll not begrudge you your handsome face. <laughs> now, let me go. It's a long way back to Jamaica Inn. I'll see you on your way. I'll walk with you as far as Rushyford Gate. Are you coming with me to Lansdome on Christmas Eve? You'd best be out the way from Jamaica that day if I know my brother. He'll be just recovering from his brandy bed by then and looking for trouble. I'll bring you home by midnight. Say you'll come, Mary. Suppose you're caught at Lansdon with Mr. Bassett's <coughs> pony. You'd look a fool then, wouldn't you? And so would I if they clapped me in prison alongside of you. Well, no one's going to catch me. Not for a long time. Why can't you take a risk, Mary? Don't you like excitement that you're so careful of your own skin? <laughs> <laughs> they must breed their girls soft down Alfred Way. All right, Jem Merlin. You needn't think I'm afraid. And anyway, I'd just soon be in prison as holed up in Jamaica Inn. Here's the stream. You don't have to come any further. I can find my own way from here. Very well, then. You can give the landlord my respects, if you like, and tell him I hope his temper has improved. Ask him if he'd care for me to hang a bunch of mistletoe over the porch of Jamaica Inn. It's late. I'm going to go to bed. Your uncle's in the parlour asleep in his chair. He was asking for you earlier. I thought he was too far gone to talk. What did he want? He wouldn't tell me. He's sound asleep now. Won't wake again tonight. You won't stay up, will you, child? You look worn out. I'll sit for a little while longer. Well, I'll say good night then. Good night, Aunt Patience. Jem knew that my room is over the porch. The man who lay in hiding in the guest room the night the lawyer Clark was killed could have heard me moving about and talking to Aunt Patience. Is Jem that man? He said it was a question of life and death, even murder. The rope swinging backwards and forwards, and the door opening onto the moor. <laughs> Who's there? Who is that? What are you doing? Why don't you speak? Oh. Put away that knife. Put it away, I tell you. Uncle Joss, Uncle Joss, it's me. Uh, Ma Mary? Oh. Is it you, Mary? Where have they gone? Have you seen them? There's no one here, only me. And Patience has gone to bed. Are you ill? Can I help you? They can't scare me. Dead men don't harm the living. They're blotted out like a candle. I said, isn't it, Mary? Oh, yes, Uncle Joss. It's dreams, all dreams. The faces stand out like live things in the darkness. And I wake with the sweat pouring down my back. Oh. There's brandy on the dresser, Mary. Get it for me. Pour me a glass. Yes, Uncle. Is that enough? More. Oh, that's it. You're a good girl. I'm fond of you, Mary. You got sense and you got pluck. You'd make a good companion to a man. They ought to have made you a boy. Here. Here, come close. Down here. 
by my side where I can talk to you. You've got guts in you. You're not scared like you're on. It's this cursed drink makes a fool of me. I'm as weak as a rat when it has hold of me. You can see that. I have dreams. Nightmares. I see things that never scare me when I'm sober. Damn it, Mary. I've killed men with my own bare hands. Trampled them underwater. I've never thought no more about it. I've slept in my bed like a child. But when I drunk, I see them in my dreams. I see their white green faces Ooh. staring at me with their eyes eaten by the fish. And some of them are torn with the flesh hanging on their bones in ribbons. And some of them have seaweed in their hair. There was a woman once, Mary. She was clinging to a raft, and she had a child in her arms. Her hair was streaming down her back. The ship was close in on the rocks, you see, and the sea was as flat as your hand, and they were all coming in alive, the whole bunch of them. And she cried out to me to help her, Mary, and I smashed her face in with a stone. <laughs> I watched her and her child drown in a few feet of water. Oh, we were afraid some of them might reach the shore, don't you see? We had to break their arms and legs, and they drowned there in front of us. Oh. Oh. Did you never hear of wreckers, Mary? Wreckers? The sound of that clock rings in my head sometimes, like the tolling of a bellboy. I've heard it in my dreams. I heard it tonight. A mournful, weary sound, Mary, is a bellboy. When you work on the coast, you have to pull out to them in a boat and muffle them. Wrap the tongue in flannel. That deadens them. Oh, there's silence then. Maybe it's misty. Maybe it's a misty night with patches of fog on the water. And outside the bay, there'll be a ship casting for a scent like a hound. She listens for the boy, and no sound comes to her. And she comes in then, driving through the fog. She comes straight into us, us waiting for her, Mary. And we see her shudder suddenly and strike. And then the surf has her. Oh, have you ever seen flies caught in a jar of treacle? I've seen men like that, stuck in the rigging like a swarm of flies. They cling there for safety, shouting in terror at the sight of the surf. I've seen the ship break up beneath them, and the masts and the yards snap like thread, and they'll be flung into the sea to swim for their lives. But when they reach the shore, they're dead men, Mary. Dead men tell no tales. You've got two ponies tethered behind. Are you reckoning to sell them both at the fair? Double profit, Mary Ellen. And you shall have a new dress if you help me. <laughs> In the meantime, here, I brought you a new kerchief for your head. That's very kind of you. I'm afraid you've wasted your money all the same. I shan't wear it. What's the matter with you today? Your colour is gone and you've no light in your eyes. Are you feeling sick or do you have a pain in your belly? I've not been out of the house since I saw you last. I stayed up in my room with my thoughts. They didn't make cheerful company. I'm a deal older than I was four days ago. Well, I'm sorry you've lost your looks. I fancied jogging into Larsdon with a pretty girl beside me. The fellows looking up as we passed and winking. Ooh, you're drab today. Don't lie to me, Mary. I'm not as blind as you think. What's happened at Jamaica Inn? What's the mystery? 
There's no mystery in it. You asked me last time we met if I knew why my aunt looked like a living ghost. Those are your words, weren't they? Well, I know now, that's all. That drink's a funny thing. I got drunk once in Amsterdam. Time I ran away to sea. I remember hearing a church clock strike half past nine in the evening, and I was sitting on the floor with my arms round a pretty red-haired girl. Next thing I knew, it was the following morning, and I was lying on my back in the gutter without any boots or breeches. I often wonder what I did in those ten hours. I thought and I thought, but I'm damned if I can remember. That's very fortunate for you. Your brother is not so lucky. When he gets drunk, he finds his memory instead of losing it. If he's alone, he can talk to himself. It wouldn't have much effect on the walls of Jamaica Inn. This time, he was not alone, though. I happened to be there when he woke from the effects of his stupor, and he'd been dreaming. And when you heard him tell his dreams, you shut yourself in your bedroom for four days. Is that it? That's as near as you'll ever get to it. What are you going to do about it? I haven't made up my mind, and I have Aunt Patience to consider. Anyway, you don't expect me to tell you, surely? Why not? I told her I hold no brief for Joss. You're his brother. That's enough for me. But there are many gaps in the story, and you fit remarkably well into some of them. Do you think I'd waste my time working for my brother? Waste your time? There's a fortune to be made in my uncle's business, if you've the conscience for it. Dead men tell no tales, Jem Merlin. No, but dead ships do. When they run ashore in a fair wind, it's lights a vessel looks for Mary when she's seeking harbour. Have you ever seen a moth flutter into a candle and singe his wings? A ship will do the same to a false light. Well, it may happen once, twice, three times perhaps. But the fourth time, a dead ship stinks to high heaven. The whole country's up in arms and wants to know the reason why. Yeah, my brother's lost his own rudder by now and he's heading for the shore himself. Will you keep him company? What have I to do with him? He can run his own head into the noose. Well, I may have helped myself to backy now and then, and <laughs> I've run cargoes. But I tell you one thing, Mary Ellen, and you can believe it or not, as you wish, I've never killed a man yet. Have we far to go? Boy, are you tired? Not I. I just want to get my bearings. There's a ford over the Inny River a little way ahead, and then we come out on the Lanston Road. So, you think I wreck ships, do you? Stand on the shore and watch men drown. Then put my hand in their pockets afterwards when they're swollen with water. Well, it makes a pretty picture. You haven't denied it yet, have you? If you believe that, me, why are you driving with me to Lanston? For the sake of your bright eyes, Jen Merlin. No other reason. <laughs> What a crowd, eh? Looks like the whole of Cornwall has come to Lanson. And Devon, too. I've never seen anything like it. There used to be a Christmas fair at Helston, but it was nothing like this. <laughs> oh, it's so alive. They all look so determined to enjoy themselves. And we'll enjoy ourselves, too, Mary. Are you not going to wear the kerchief I've bought you? Yes, I'll wear it. <laughs> Here. Let me tie it for you. Thank you. We'll stable the jingle up by the castle and see what luck we have with the ponies. The horse rings on the main square. What if there's somebody here from North Hill, or from one of the farms nearby? Aren't you worried they might recognise the ponies? Today I'm not worrying about anything, Mary. And don't you either. That black pony there. Where'd you get him? He was never on the moors. Not with that at his shoulders. Well, he was foaled at Callingham four years ago. I bought him as a yearling from old Tim Bray. Well, you remember Tim. Can't say as I do. We sold up last year and went into Dorset. Ah, Tim always told me I'd get my money back on this pony. The dam was Irish bred and won prizes for him up country. Does she now? Well, you take a look at him. But, um, he's not going cheap, I'm telling you that. Uh, there's a strange feel to him. Very coarse on the surface and sharp like bristles. There's a taint about him I don't like. You haven't been doping him, have you? <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that pony. Well, the other one there, well, he fell away to nothing last summer, but I bought him back all right. 
But you can't fault the black pony. No, no, no. It's it's my opinion the sow was a grey. See, look at the short hair there, close to the skin. Well, that's grey, isn't it? Yeah, two missed a great bargain with this pony. Well, look at those shoulders. There's breeding for you. What are you asking for him? I'll take 18 guineas for him. Mm. Make it 15, we might do business. No, nope. 18 guineas is my sum and not a penny less. I wouldn't be too hasty, Stevens. Huh? I'd advise another opinion on that pony. <laughs> I'm not satisfied with him. Where's your mark? Here. Don't you see the slit in his ear? Let's have a look. Oh, you're a sharp customer, aren't you? Anyone would think I'd stolen him. Well, anything wrong with the mark? Not that I can see. But it's a good thing for you that Tim Bray has got into Dorset. He never owned that pony, whatever you say. <laughs> you think so? Well, I wouldn't touch him if I were you. You'll find yourself in trouble. Hmm. He's a good looker, though. I don't care who bred him or if he saw his pie bowl. What makes you so particular, Will? Let me have a word in your ear. The ponies are fake. Stolen, most likely. Mm -hmm. All right. I've no doubt you're right. You've got an eye for trouble. My partner doesn't fancy him. You can keep your pony. It's your loss. Now, if you'll take my advice, you'll come down on your price. What happens now? Oh, we stay. But it could be a long game after this, Mary. Why don't you take a turn round the fair for a while? What's happened to the other pony? I sold him. Six guineas. Well, no one's come near the black pony since those two looked him over. Oh, but look who's coming now. Stand away. Let me deal with this. Oh, look, James. Don't you see? He holds his head just like poor Beauty did. Well, the likeness will be quite striking. Only this animal is black, of course, and has nothing of Beauty's breeding. Mm. Oh, what a nuisance Roger isn't here. But I can't very well drag him out of his meeting. What do you think of him, James? Oh, damn it, Maria. You know I don't know a damn thing about horses. The pony you lost was a grey, wasn't it? It would be such a good Christmas present for the children. They plagued poor Roger so ever since Beauty disappeared. Ask the price, James, will you? Well, uh, my good fellow... Sir? Do you want to sell this pony of yours? Uh, I'm afraid not. He's promised to a friend. Besides, he wouldn't carry you. He's been ridden by children. But look here, my man. Mrs. Bassett has taken a fancy to your pony. She's lost one rather like it and wants to replace him. Oh. And she wants it for her children. You can't disappoint them, can you? Damn your friend, he'll have to wait. What is your price? Well, 25 guineas. Well, at least that's what my friend was going to pay. But, but I'm not anxious to sell it. I'll give you 30 for him. I'm Mrs. Bassett from North Hill. Well, I, I oh, can't... Nana, please. Don't be obstinate. Mm. I have half the sum here in my purse. And this gentleman here will give you the rest. Huh? Mr. Bassett is engaged on business just now. And I want the pony to be a surprise to him, as well as the children. My groom will ride the pony off to North Hill before he leaves town. Now, here, here's the money. Okay. There you are, my man. Thank you, madam. No, thank you, sir. Oh, Mr. Bassett, we pleased with your bargain. Oh, uh... You'll find the pony will be perfectly safe with the children. Oh, I'm sure he will be delighted. My groom will be here for him directly. Now, come along, James. It's getting dark and I'm chilled to the bone. Come on. Yes. Here! Boy! What do you want? Do you want to earn a five-shilling piece? Oh, sure I do. Then you hang on to this pony for me and hand him over when the groom comes to collect him, will you? All right. I've just heard word that my wife's given birth to twins and her life is in danger. Here, go on, take the bridle. A happy Christmas to you! Jim Merlin, you deserve to be hanged. <laughs> to stand there in the marketplace and sell Mrs. Bassett her own stolen pony. I've got the cheek of the devil and the hairs on my head have gone grey watching you. Well, I'm glad to see I've brought the sparkle back into your eyes, Mary. Well, come on, let's celebrate. <laughs> See you.
Look at that red shawl, Mary. Would you like to feel that round your shoulders? Hey, miss, we'll have that shawl, please. That one there. <laughs> Gold brings my ears, Jeff. <laughs> You'll make me look like a gypsy. Well, perhaps I'm turning you into the woman you really are. Uh, no, Jen Murray. I'm my own woman still. Let's find out what the fair has in store for us. There's a fortune teller. Cross the water and make your fortune, my lovely. But I say a danger lurking in the shadows. You must beware of a dark stranger. <laughs> and what do you see in my hand? There, there's blood on your hand, young man. You'll kill a man one day. What did I tell you this morning, Mary? I told you I never killed a man. The gypsy confirmed it. <laughs> she said you'd kill a man one day. <laughs> we'll get soaked if we stay here. Come into this door and let's shelter. She said there was danger lurking in the shadows. Hmm. Beware of a dark stranger. No, Jem. I've made a fool of myself quite enough for one night. It's time we thought of going back. Mary. No, Jem. Leave me alone. We must go. You don't want to ride in an open jungle in this weather, do you? It's coming down from the coast. We'll be blown over on the high ground. Oh, we'll have to spend the night together here in Lansing. Very likely. Go and fetch the pony, Jem. The rain's lifting a little. I'll wait for you here. Well, don't be such a puritan, Mary. You'll be soaked to the skin on the Bobmin Road. Pretend you're in love with me, can't you? You stay with me then. Is this the way you talk to barmaids? Is it because I'm the barmaid of Jamaica Inn? Damn Jamaica Inn! I like the look of you and the feel of you, and that's enough for any man. It ought to be enough for any woman, too. I dare say it is for some. I don't happen to be made that way. Who? Oh? Do they make you different from other women, then, down on Hilford River? Stay here with me tonight, Mary, and you can find out. You'd be like the rest by the time morning came. I take my oath on it. I haven't a doubt of it. That's why I'd rather risk a soaking in the jingle. God, you're as hard as Flint, Mary Ellen. You'll be sorry for it when you're alone again in Jamaica, eh? Better to be sorry then than later. If I kissed you again, would it make you change your mind? I would not. I don't wonder my brother took to his bed and his bottle for a week with you in the house. Do you sing psalms to him? I dare say I did. I've never known a woman so perverse. I'll buy you a ring if it'll make you feel respectable. It's not very often I have enough money in my pocket. How many wives do you happen to have? Well, six or seven scattered over Cornwall. Oh, I don't count the ones across the team. Oh, well, that's a good enough number for one man. I'd wait a while before I took an eighth if I were you. <laughs> well, you're sharp, aren't you? You look just like a monkey in that red shawl with your bright eyes. <sighs> All right, I'll fetch the jingle and take you home to your aunt. But I'll kiss you first, whether you like it or not. One for sorrow. Two for joy. I'll give you the rest when you're in a more yielding frame of mind. It wouldn't do to finish the rhyme tonight. Stay where you two. I'll not be long. Oh, there'll be little mercy out on the moors in this weather. Should I have given in to him? I won't lose my head simply to please him. If I once depart from what I've determined to do, there'll be no returning. I've given too much away as it is. And I know I'll never be entirely free of him now. I'll pace the empty rooms of Jamaica in, thinking of him. And the loneliness of the moors will be more lonely still, knowing he's only a few miles away. If only women weren't such frail, pathetic creatures. I could spend the night with Jim Merlin and forget myself in him, and part from him in the morning with a light laugh and a shrug of the shoulders. But I am a woman, and that just isn't possible. Oh, a few 
few kisses have made a fool of me already. Was that what happened to Aunt Patience after she met John? And now she trails around Jamaica in the shadow of her lord and master like a pale ghost. He's taking his time. Ah, there's no point in hanging on here in the cold. I'll go and find him. The stable's not five minutes away. People's all shut up. The shed's empty. Oh, where's he gone then? <sighs> Surely he can't just have gone off and left me by myself. What do you want? We don't give food to strangers here. I haven't come for food. I'm not a beggar. I'm looking for the man I was with. Don't you remember? We came here together with a pony and jingle. The stable's empty. Do you know where he's gone? Oh, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. Your friend's been gone 20 minutes or more. He seemed in a great hurry. There was another man with him. I wouldn't be sure, but he looked like one of the servants from the White Hart. He left no message, I suppose. No, he didn't. Why don't you try for him with the White Hart? You know where that is? What do you want here? The like of you isn't allowed here. This is a respectable establishment. I've come in search of a Mr. Jem Merlin. He came here with a pony and jingle and was seen with one of your servants. Would you please make some inquiry and find out if he's here? I'll stay here at the door then. I'll see if anyone knows him. <laughs> Would you belong for the dark gypsy fellow who tried to sell my partner a pony this afternoon? I can tell you about him. What have you to tell me? He was in the company of a gentleman barely ten minutes ago. And with the help of some of us, he was persuaded to enter a carriage that was waiting at the door. He was inclined to resist us at first, but a look from the gentleman appeared to silence him. Do you know where he went? Uh, his destination is unknown to me, and I regret to say that your companion left no message of farewell. Why don't you come in and warm yourself by the fire? The night is young, my dear. It's no weather to remain outside. No, I must go. Where are you to go in a night like this? I've some friends inside. I'll give you a lively evening. We know how to entertain a girl who takes a horse thief as a lover. No, no! Don't delude yourself that you'll see your young gallant again. Do you know what they do with those thieves? What do they do? They string them up, my dear. They string them up. You won't see your lover again till he's dancing a jig on the castle gallows. So come on in, my lovely. We'll help you to forget him. In part two of Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, Mary Yellen was played by Susanna Corbett and Joss Merlin by John Woodvine. Aunt Patience, Oriel Smith, Jem Merlin, Mark Straker, Francis Davy, James Lawrenson, Squire Bassett, Vincent Brimble, Mrs. Bassett, Anne Jameson, Richards, Sean Arnold, James, Andrew Wincott, The Boy, Emma Fielding, The Fortune Teller, Joanna Myers, the stable keeper, Eric Allen. The horse dealers, Alan Barker and Peter Gunn. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Jamaica Inn was dramatized for radio by Michael Bakewell and directed by Enid Williams. I had come to Jamaica Inn after the death of my mother to live with my Aunt Patience and her husband, Joss Merlin. I soon discovered that my uncle was a wrecker and a murderer, and that his brother Jem was a common horse thief. But I had gone with Jem to the Christmas Eve fair at last, and for all that. He was going to drive us back in his cart, but he never returned. I was told that he had been taken for stealing. There was nothing for it but to take the long, lonely road back to Jamaica Inn. We present Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn. Come in, out of the rain, Mary. Thank you. 
Once more, I have the good fortune to help you by the wayside. Oh, you're wet through to the skin. You'd better get out of those wet things. Yes, but... Oh, there's a dry rug here you cover yourself with. Thank you. As for your feet, they will be better bare. What were you doing out on the road by yourself? I... I went to the fair with a man I met once when I was walking on the moors. He lives by breaking horses. He'd gone to the fair to sell a pony and there was trouble. I'm afraid he might have been caught up in some dishonesty. I... I lost him. I don't know what happened to him. So, you've not been so lonely after all. Jamaica Inn was not so isolated as you supposed. What was the name of your companion? He was my uncle's brother. You will think ill of me, of course, after all I've said of my uncle to make a friend of his brother. He is dishonest and a thief. I know that. He told me as much at the beginning. But beyond that... You mean the brother knows nothing of the landlord's trade by night? He's not of the company who bring the wagons to Jamaica Inn? I don't know. He admits nothing. He just shrugs his shoulders. But he told me one thing. That he had never killed a man, and I believed him. I still believe him. He said also that my uncle was running straight into the arms of the law, and they would catch him before long. He surely would not say that if he was one of the company. Who can tell? You told me before you had some acquaintance with Squire Bassett. Perhaps you have influence with him, too. You could no doubt persuade him to deal mercifully with Jem Merlin when the time comes. Oh, my acquaintance with Mr. Bassett is of the slightest. Once or twice we've given one another good afternoon and we've spoken of matters relating to our respective parishes. It is hardly likely that he would spare a thief because of me, especially if the thief is guilty yeah, and happens to be the brother of the landlord of Jamaica Inn. You appear anxious for his safety. I am, yes. And... If your new friend was guilty of other things, of conspiring with his brother against the belongings and perhaps the lives of his fellow men, what then, Mary Ellen? Would you still seek to save him? Oh, I didn't bargain for this. I could face the brutality of my uncle and the pathetic, dumb stupidity of Aunt Patience. I could bear the silence and the horror of Jamaica in without shrinking or running away. I didn't even mind being lonely. But now I'm going round and round like a squirrel in a cage and all big claws of a man who has nothing to do with my brain or my understanding. <laughs> I don't want to love like a woman or feel like a woman, Mr. Davy. <laughs> How old are you? Twenty-three. Very young, Mary Ellen. You'll come through your little crisis. Women like you have no need to shed tears over a man encountered once or twice. And the first kiss is not a thing that is remembered. Come now, dry your eyes. <laughs> You're not the first to bite your nails over a lost lover. Hmm? Huh? So, was I right in my surmise and has all been quiet at Jamaica Inn since I saw you last? Mr. Davy. Have you ever heard of wreckers? Wreckers? When I was a child at Helford and I heard people speak of them, I thought they were horrible, evil-minded inventions. I know now that my uncle is a wrecker. He told me so himself. They are in it. Every one of them. All the men I saw that first Saturday in the bar at the inn. They've murdered women and children with their own hands. They've killed them with rocks and stones. And that's why my uncle is feared and loathed by the timid people in the cottages and farms and why all doors are barred against him. My aunt lives in mortal terror of discovery and my uncle has only to lose himself in drink before a stranger and his secret is spilt to the four winds. There, Mr. Davy. Now you know the truth about Jamaica Inn. The landlord talks when he's drunk. Perhaps that's why I've lost faith in humanity and in God and in myself. And that's why I acted like a fool today in Lanston. We're approaching five lanes in the turning to Alternon. The driver is bound for Bodmin and I will tell him to take you to Jamaica Inn. I shall leave you at five lanes and walk down into the village. You'll have ample time to struggle back into your wet clothes. Tell me, am I the only man you've honoured with your confidence or do I share it with the landlord's brother? Jim Merlin knows. We spoke of it this morning. He said little, and I know he's not friendly with my uncle. Anyway, what does it matter now that Jim has been taken into custody for another crime? I suppose he could save his own skin by betraying his brother. What then, Mary Ellen? It would be a straw to clutch at. But he could only do that if he'd never been involved. 
And there is always the doubt, isn't there? A guilty man does not usually tie the rope round his own neck. How can I be certain? Our bright days are done, and we are for the dark. If we were permitted to take our text from Shakespeare, there would be strange sermons preached in Cornwall tomorrow. Your uncle and his companions are not members of my congregation, however, and even if they were, they would not understand me. A week from now, it will bring the new year. The false lights will have flickered for the last time, and there will be no more wreckings. The candles will be blown. I don't understand you. One moment. Driver! Set me down at five lanes. Right you are, sir. I've been tonight at a meeting in Lanston. We were informed that His Majesty's government is to set up regular patrols along the coast. There will be watchers on the coast instead of the wreckers' lights. And the officers of the law will tread the smugglers' paths. The troubles are over, Mary. Your aunt will sleep in peace again. Your uncle will drink himself to death. <laughs> or he will turn Wesleyan and preach to travellers on the high road. As for you, you will ride south again and find a lover. Sleep well tonight. Tomorrow is Christmas Day, and the bells of Altonan will be ringing for peace and goodwill. I shall think of you. Driver, take this lady to Jamaica Inn. Jamaica Inn? You need stop only long enough to set her down. Good night. Good night, sir. And a happy Christmas to you. Yeah! I wish he'd taken me with him. There's shelter and there's peace at Alternan. I could have gone to church tomorrow for the first time since Halford. Oh, he's a strange man. I feel safe with him. And yet there's a kind of uneasiness at the same time. He's a kind of freak of nature with his white hair and albino eyes. If he were an animal, he'd be hunted down and destroyed by the rest of the pack. Have a look at you. My God, it's Mary Yellow. Traveling in style like a fine lady. So it's you, is it? You've chosen to come back again like a whining bitch with your tail between your legs. Give it to us, John! She'd make a nice Christmas present. Oh, she's been out in the rain. Should we warm her up, Joss? So you're dumb, are you? You'll come to heel if I have to kill you first. You think you can stand against me with your monkey face and your damned impudence? What do you think you're doing at midnight, riding the King's Highway in a hired carriage, half naked with your hair down your back? <laughs> you're nothing but a common slut! <laughs> bloody murderer and a thief and the law knows it too the whole of Cornwall knows it what? your reign is over just Merlin I've been to Lanston today to inform against you oh, such a bitch drink your eyes get back get back you damn fools can't you see she's trying to save her skin by lies how can she inform against me when she knows nothing. <laughs> there, she's never walked 11 miles to Lansom. Look at her feet. She's been with a man somewhere down on the road, and he sent her back on wheels when he'd had enough of her. <laughs> Get up, or do you want me to rub your nose in the mud? Get up! Now look there. There's a break in the sky, and the rain's going east. In six hours' time, it'll be a wild grey dawn on the coast, and there'll be ships for the picking. We'll waste no more time here. Harry? Yes, Josh? We'll take the carriage. It'll carry half a dozen of us. And send one of them to get the pony and the cart from the stable. He's had no work for a week. Right away, Josh. Come on, you lazy drunken devils. Uh. 
Don't you want to feel gold and silver run through your hands? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I've lain like a hog for seven crazy days, and by God, I feel like a child again tonight. And I want a coast again. Who'll take the road with me tonight? Yes, 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 yes. Get in the carriage, Mary Ellen. I'll not go with you. Get in there, damn your eyes. <laughs> You'd inform against me, would you? You'd run to the law and have me swinging on a rope's end like a cat. All right, then. You shall have your chance. You shall stand on the shore, Mary, with the wind and sea in your face, and you shall watch for the dawn and the coming in of the tide. You know what that means, don't you? You know where I'm going to take you. You think you're not afraid of me, don't you? You sneer at me with your pretty white face and your bright monkey eyes. Oh, yeah, I'm drunk. I'm drunk as a king. And heaven and earth can go smash for all I care. Tonight, we shall ride in glory, every man jack of us. Maybe for the last time. And you shall come with us, Mary, to the coast. Business tonight and pants to boys, you'll all need your lantern so bright. For from London be down to pants to boys, there'll be watery graves this dark night. <laughs> and where have you been then, pretty bird? Get off me! The streets of your bodies are all untied and your skirts wet with mud. You're foul. You stink of dirt and tobacco and stale drink. Oh, have you been in a ditch with some young gallant? Have you? Have you? Have you? If she asks, she'll answer to me for it when we get back to Jamaica. <laughs> but before we return there, she's going to see sights she'll never forget. You might close your bright eyes against me, my pretty, but you'll open them wide enough once we get to the sea and you watch us go in about our business. <laughs> get on with your song, Harry. Rocks between Heartland and Pats, two oh, boys will be gravestones before this night's through. And ghost ships will sail into Pats, two boys, you'll see the dead eyes of the crew. Be Please, God, let me sleep. Let me blot it all out, slip away into the darkness, forget the pain. God, let me sleep. They've gone. They've gone and left me alone in the carriage. Why have they left me here? Oh, they've taken away the horse and left the carriage in a gully. A gully which leads down to the sea. Somewhere down there in the darkness, Joss Merlin and his men are waiting for the tide. And they're not singing and shouting any longer. They're waiting there in silence, waiting for a ship which they'll lure onto the rocks. I can't just stay here and let this happen. I must try and get word to someone. They've locked the door. But I might just manage to get through the window. There's nothing to get a grip on. The roof's all slippery with the rain. I'll just have to try and lift myself. I'm through. The gully goes down to the sea, sure enough. But if I go around the other way, it'll lead to the high ground and the cliffs. And somewhere there'll be a road, a road to take me to where the nearest people dwell. Oh, I can't see a yard in front of me. Nothing but black... So my pretty little birds got out of a cage. No! <laughs> You think you'd stumble into old Harry, did you? Thought we were all of us down on the shore with Uncle Joss baiting the pots. <laughs> and so, when you woke from your beauty sleep, you decided to take a walk up the lane. And now you're here, I'll make you very welcome. It's cold and damp in the ditch, but there's no odds now. And I won't be the first you've had in a ditch tonight. No! Oh, oh, my God! <laughs> you're not going to get away. I can see you turned against Joss by the way you spoke to him tonight. He's no right to keep you up at Jamaica like a bird in a cage with no pretty things to wear. 
I doubt if he's given you so much as a brooch for your bodice, has he? Oh, don't you wait about that, Mary, my dear. I'll give you a lace for your neck, and bangles for your wrist, and soft silk for your skin. <sighs> Uh, let's look at you now. No! You won't fight me after for your bitch. No! Oh, my eyes. My eyes. You've done me, your bitch. I'll get you for this. Come back. Come back. I'm going the wrong way. This is taking me to the sea, but I can't turn back now. They're down there, waiting by the shoreline, crouched by the rocks. Their eyes are fixed on the sea. They'll never notice me. It's a long, cold wait tonight. Maybe we've come here on a wild goose chase. Hold your tongues. Keep your eyes on the sea. There's a light on the cliff, like a small white eye in the darkness. And there's a man standing by it. It's a wrecker's lantern to guide ships onto the rocks. There's a ship! A ship coming in with the tide! <laughs> Hold your noise! Caleb, get back to your post. Not a whisper until she hits the rocks. It's coming. I can see its lights out there. It's coming towards the shore, driving right onto the rocks. Not a word, I said. <laughs> Silence! It's coming straight for their light, like a moth drawn by a flame. I've got to do something. I've got to stop them. Stop! What? Stop! Turn back! There's danger! Turn back! <laughs> Get her! Drag her down! Let them see her! No! Get her! Get her! No! Oh, you know, tie her up and stand guard over her. If she makes a noise again, slit her throat. Yes, Joss. Chant you'd have had a warning the ship. Make sure you won't play any more tricks. Yeah. The boat's coming in like we were drawing her with a line. Get to your posts. It's a meant to strike. There's a grey light on the water, and the sky is starting to grow pale. Oi, get your hands off that neck, that's mine! Hold your hand, right, man! Or I'll break your heads together! It's, it's getting light! Just, you see, the dawn's coming! We had to stay our time. You must be away from here. What can we do with the girl? Ah, slit her throat! She comes back with us, I'll see to her. Get back to the wagons, quickly, before anyone spoils us! Where's the blasted horse? Ah, never mind that now! Turn the carriage round! <laughs> it's stuck in the mud! Just fall for God's sake and I'll come round! <laughs> What the devil are you doing, you damn fools? You've smashed the wheel! You've set fire to the carriage. You want nothing that can lead them back to us. Yes, Joss. How are we gonna get back? The farm car! Where's the farm car? It's up the lane, quickly! Come on! There'll never be enough room in the cart! Then we'll have to make room. Is that the girl you got there? She tried to warn the ship. She asked to come back with us. My God. What's happened to your face? I scratched it on a bush. We'd best get back to the cart. Hey, there's no room for more. We'll never move it. One more won't make any difference. You can't leave me here. Get your hands off. There's no more room. Get off the cart. All of you, save yourself, Joss Merlin. You're the one that brought us here. Now you can stay and say what's coming to you. Get off the cart, I said. We're not taking orders from you anymore. Ah! You heard what he said. Oh. Get him. There's only two of them. No! No, shoot! 
Quick, there's no time to lose. Stow those barrels. But what about all the other stuff on the shore? I have to leave it there. It'd take ten men to shift it. It's getting light. What do we do with the bodies, Josh? Drag them down the gully and burn them with the carriage. And the girl? Sling her in the back of the car. I'll do that. <laughs> you take Caleb, Barry. I'll see to the other one. Dear God in heaven, it is Christmas Day. You may close your bright eyes against me, but you will open them wide enough when we get to the sea. I'll give you soft silk for your skin. Let's look now. Mary? Mary, my dear? Mary? Mary? I'm patience. I'm patience. Oh, God. No. <laughs> It's all right, my dear. You're safe at home. Safe at home? Safe in Jamaica Inn? You know what happened? You know what they did to me? Oh, Mary. Mary, what could I have done? How long have I lain here? For two days, Mary. Oh, you should have wakened me. I'm not a child to be mothered and pampered because of a few bruises. There's work for me to do. You couldn't move. Your poor body was bleeding and cut. I bathed you while you were still unconscious. I thought at first they'd injured you terribly, but thank God no real harm has come to you. No harm. Your bruises will heal, Mary. And you think that'll be the end of it? That I'll simply put it all out of my mind? You know where they took me, don't you? And you know who led them? Oh, Mary. <laughs> I've lain here long enough. What are you going to do? I've business of my own. Your uncle is downstairs. He will not let you leave the house. I'm not afraid of him. Oh, Mary, for your sake, for my sake, do not anger him again. You know what you've suffered already. Ever since he returned with you, he has sat below, white and terrible, a gun across his knees. The doors of the inn are barred. I know you've seen and endured horrible, unspeakable things, Mary. But don't you understand? If you go down now, he may hurt you again. He may even kill you. Oh, I've never seen him like this before. Don't go down. I beg you on my knees not to go down. I'm patience. I have gone through enough out of loyalty to you. You can't expect me to put up with any more. Whatever Uncle Joss may have been to you once, he is inhuman now. All your tears won't save him from justice. You must realise that. Mary, don't you understand? He's, He's a brute, half mad with brandy and blood. Men were murdered by him on the shore, drowned in the sea. I can see nothing else, think of nothing else until my dying day. Be quiet, Mary. He's here. I thought I heard voices in the yard. I went to a chink in the shutters, downstairs in the parlor. But I saw no one. Did you hear anything from this room? Oh, he'll come. He's bound to come. I've cut my own throat. I've gone against him. He warned me once and I laughed at him. I didn't listen. I wanted to play the game on my own. We're as good as dead. All three of us. Just, it's not too late. We could... We're finished. The game is up. Why did you let me drink? Why didn't you break every blessed bottle in the house and turn the key on me and let me lie? I'd not have hurt you. I'd not have touched a hair of your heads, either of you. 
No, it's too late. What do you mean? Who are you afraid of? No, Mary Ellen, I'm not drunk now. My secrets are still my own. But I'll tell you one thing. There's no escape for you. You're in it now as much as patience there. Only we have enemies on either side of us now. We have the law on one hand and on the other. Oh, you'd like to know, wouldn't you, Mary? You'd like to sneak out of the house with, with that name on your lips and betray me. You'd like to see me hanged. All right. Oh, I don't blame you for it. I've hurt you enough to make you remember for the rest of your days, haven't I? But I saved you too, didn't I? Have you thought what that rabble would have done to you if I hadn't been there? Oh, you can put one good mark against me for that alone. Nobody touched you that night but me. And I've not spoiled your pretty face. Cuts and bruises, men. Don't me. Why, you poor weak thing. You know as well as I do. I could have had you the first week at Jamaica in if I'd wanted to. Yes, by heaven. And you'd be lying at my feet now like your aunt patient, crushed and contented and clinging. Another goddamn bloody fool. Oh, let's get out of here. This room stinks of damp and decay. Come down to the kitchen. Why do we have to sit here waiting for them to come and take us? Why can't we creep away before it's too late? We could be in Lance and then across into Devon in a few hours. We could travel by night. You damned idiot. Oh. Don't you realise there are people on the road between here and Lance and who think I'm the devil himself? We're only waiting their chance to fix every crime in Cornwall on my head. The whole country knows by now what happened on the coast on Christmas Eve. And if they see us bolting, they'll have the proof. But if we stay here... God, I... don't you think I'm not itching to get away and save my skin? We'd look fine, wouldn't we? Riding in the trap on top of our goods and chattels, like farmers on market day waving goodbye in Lanson Square. No... We've got one chance, one single chance in a million. If we sit tight here at Jamaica Inn, they may start scratching their heads. They've got to look for proof before they lay hands on us. And unless one of that blasted rabble turns informer, they won't get proof. And what about the ship lying with its back broken on the rocks and the bodies floating beside it? What about the loot you left on the beach? What about your own men who you shot when you were fighting for the cart? Who's to say how the ship came on the rocks? Oh, it'll look dirty, it'll look bad for us. But where's the proof? Ask me that. I spent my Christmas Eve like a respectable man in the bosom of my family, playing cat's cradle with my niece. And now that we've both come to our senses again, you can tell me... What you were doing in that carriage, Mary, and where you'd been. And if you don't answer me, you know me well enough by now. I can find a way of making you talk. I'll tell you what I did that day, and you can believe me or not. It doesn't matter much to me what you think. I couldn't bear the thought of spending Christmas Eve here at Jamaica Inn. So I walked to Lanson and went to the fair. By eight o'clock I was tired, and when it came to rain and blow I was wet through and fit for nothing. I hired that carriage, and I told the man I wanted him to take me to Badman. I thought if I said Jamaica in, he would have refused the journey. There. I've nothing more to tell you than that. Hmm. Were you alone in Lanson? Of course I was alone. And you spoke to no one? I bought a handkerchief from a woman at a stall. All right, Mary. Whatever I did to you now, you'd tell the same story, wouldn't you? You got the advantage of me for once, because I can't prove if you're lying or not. Not many maids of your age would spend the day alone in Lanson, I can tell you that. Nor would they drive home by themselves. 
but you're not like the others, Mary. And if your story's true, then our prospects improve. They'll never trace the driver here. God damn it. I shall feel like another drink in a minute. You shall drive in your own coach yet, Patience, and wear feathers in your bonnet and a velvet cloak. I'm not beaten yet. I'll see the old ban of them in hell first. You wait. We'll start afresh again. We'll live like fighting cocks. Listen. Listen. Don't you move. Neither of you. I'm going to pull the shutters open. Just, just be careful. Keep quiet, you idiot. Harry. Oh, God damn you. Do you want a bullet in your guts, you blasted fool? Come inside, can't you? Unbolt the door, Mary. Don't lean against the wall there like a blasted ghost. There's nerves enough in this age without you turning sour. Thank you, mistress. You're lucky you didn't get a bullet in your belly. Have you brought any news? Have you gone to offer me a drink, Jess? Mary, get us a drink. Brandy. What else? The whole country's gone up in smoke. Every chitter in tongue in Cornwall from the tame artisan and Ives. I was in Bodmin this forenoon. The town was ringing with it and the hut mad for blood and justice. Last night I slept at Camelford. Every man jack in the place shaking his fist and blabbing to his neighbour. There'll be only one end to this storm, Jess. And you know the name for it, don't you? <laughs> I know the name well enough. Here's your drink. We've got to run for it, Joss. It's our only chance. The, the, the roads are poison, and Bodman and Launston, worst of all. I'll keep to the moors and get into Devon above Gunners Lake. It'll take me longer, I know that, but what's the odds if I save my skin? You hear what he says. It's madness to stop here. We must go now at once before it's too late. They'll all be after you. The people will have no mercy upon you. They'll kill you without trial. Oh, for God's sake, listen to him, Joss. You know I don't care for myself. It's for you. Shut that... your mouth, can't you? <laughs> I've never asked your counsel yet, and I don't ask it now. I can face what's coming to me alone without your bleating beside me like a sheep. So, you'll throw your hand in too, Harry, will you? Run with your tail between your legs because a lot of Clarks and Wesleyans are howling for your blood. Have they proved the wrecking on us? Tell me that. Or has your conscience gone against you? Damn my conscience, Joss. It's common sense I'm thinking of. I've stuck to you, haven't I? Come out here today, risking my neck to give you a warning. But it was your stupidity brought us into this mess, wasn't it? You got us mad drunk like yourself and led us on a crazy harebrained venture that none of us had planned. We took a chance in a million and the chance came off too damn bloody well. Because we were drunk, we lost our heads, left the stuff and a hundred tracks scattered on the shore. And whose fault was it? Why, yours, I say. So you accuse me, do you, Harry? You're like the rest of your kind, wriggling like a snake when the luck of the game turns against you. Run, then, if you like. Run to Tamar Bank with your tail between your legs and be damned to you. I'll take on the world alone. Oh, come on now, Joss. We can talk, can't we, without cutting each other's throats? I've not gone against you. I'm on your side still. Our old gang is scattered, and we needn't reckon with them. They'd be too scared to show their heads and worry us. That leaves you and me, Joss. We've been in this business, the pair of us, deeper than most, and the more we help each other, the better it'll be for us both. That's why I'm here, to talk it over and see where we stand. Just what would you be driving at, Harry? I'm not driving at anything. I, I want to make things easier for all of us. We, we've got to quit, that's evident, unless we want to swing. But it's like this, Joss. I don't see the fun in quitting empty-handed for all that. Uh, there's that mint of stuff we dumped along in the room yonder two days ago. And by rights, it belongs to all of us who work for it on Christmas Eve. But there's none of them left to claim it but you and me. I'm not saying there's much of value. It's probably mostly junk. But I don't see why some of it shouldn't help us into Devon, do you? So you didn't come to Jamaica in because of my sweet smile alone, then, eh? 
I was thinking you were fond of me, Harry, and wanted to hold my hand. Where's the harm in plain speaking, Joss? We're friends, aren't we? I mean, the stuff's here, and it'll take two men to shift it. The women here can't do it. What's against you and me striking a bargain and be done with it? Uh, supposing the stuff is near. Supposing I've disposed of it already. I've been kicking my heels here for two days since Christmas Eve, and I've had plenty of time to get rid of it. Do you play a double game here at Jamaica Inn? I, you've been mighty silent sometimes, Joss Merlin. I've seen things sometimes I haven't understood and heard things too. You made a brilliant job of this trade, month in, month out. Too brilliant, some of us thought, for the small profit we made out of it. And it was us who took most of the risks. We didn't know how you did it, did we? Tell me, Joss Merlin... Do you take your orders from one above you? Don't no. Don't. Move. And you're a dead man. Put the gun away, Joss. D -d -d Don't point it at me. There's no call for that. Stay where you are. Don't move. And listen to what I have to say. Oh, I will, Joss. I'm the leader of this game. And I've always been. Can you see me taking orders? My God, I'd like to meet the man who dared to try me. Our trade was the biggest in the country, from Hartland to Hale. But now, it's over. We've run our course and our day is done. The game's up for all of us. You didn't come here tonight to warn me. You came to see what you could get out of the smash. No, Joss, that's not the way it You was. scraped at the window there because you knew from experience that the hasp of the shutter is loose and easy to force. You didn't think to find me here, did you? Joss, it's like I You said, hoped I it would be patience here, or Mary, and you'd scare them easy, wouldn't you? And reach for my gun, where it hangs on the wall, as you've often seen. And then to hell with the landlord of Jamaica Inn. You got it all wrong, Joss. You little rat. Do you think I didn't see it in your eye when I flung back the shutter and saw your face at the window? You think I never heard your gasp of surprise, nor watched your sudden yellow grin? I told you, Joss, I came to warn you. Very well. We'll strike a bargain. You and I, as you suggested. I've changed my mind after all, my loving friend. And with your help, we'll take the road across the moors to Devon. There's stuff in this place worth taking, as you say, and I can't load it alone. I knew you'd see it my way, Joss. Tomorrow is Sunday, and a blessed day of rest. Not even the reckon of fifty ships will drag the people of this country from their knees. There'll be blinds down and sermons and long faces and prayers offered for poor sailor men who come by misadventure by the devil's hands. But they'll not go seeking the devil on the Sabbath. <laughs> sure they won't, Joss. Twenty-four hours we have, Harry, my boy. And tomorrow night, when you've broken your back, spade in turf and turnips to cover up the goods in the farm cart, and kiss me goodbye, and patience too, and maybe Mary as well, why then... You go down on your knees and thank Joss Merlin for letting you go free with your life. <laughs> Instead of squatting on your scut in a ditch where you belong with a bullet in your black heart. Put the gun away, Joss. You're a pretty marksman in your way, Harry. <laughs> Isn't that the spot you touched on Ned Santo the other night? <laughs> you laid his windpipe bare. And the blood whistled out in a stream. That's where you got him, wasn't it? Come on, get on your feet. You think I'm going to play with you all night? Open the kitchen door, Patience. Yes, Charles. Turn right, walk down the passage till I tell you to stop. Patience, you keep by my side. You too, Mary. Ask the way. No use you looking into the bar, Harry. You can't escape that way. Every door and window in the place is barred. Take my keys, Patience, and open the door to the storeroom. Yes, Joss. Your aunts have been itching to explore the wreckage we brought from the shore, haven't they, Harry? You shall spend the night in the storeroom amongst it all. You know, Patience, I believe this is the first time we've offered hospitality at the inn for the night. 
In you go, Ari. Don't feed the rocks. Though you can't let them feed on you if they wish. What are you staring at me for, Mary? You better get your supper and go to bed. You have a long journey before you tomorrow night. And I warn you, here and now, it won't be an easy one. I'll have no supper tonight. I'll go up. You shall sleep sander if I turn the key on you. I want no prowlers in the passage. And you patience. Fasten the shutters. Right. And when you've finished your supper, you too can go to bed. Yes, trust. I shan't leave the kitchen tonight. Why are you standing there, Mary? Go on up. I'm coming with you. And give thanks that you've got a bed to sleep in. And that you're not sharing the storeroom with a peddler and the rats. All right, give me your key, Mary. I have a soft spot for you, Mary. And you've got spirit still, and pluck, for all the knocks I've given you. I've seen it in your eyes tonight. There's danger for me ahead. Never mind the law. I can bluff my way to freedom if it comes to that. The whole of Cornwall can come running at my heels for all I care. It's the other game I have to watch for. Footsteps, Mary, that come in the night, and a hand that would strike me down. We'll put the Tamar between us and Jamaica in. You may care for me better in the new life we're going to lead. Good night to you, Mary. the glass. Then I'll have to sit and talk to you from here. Come closer where I can see you. I owe you an apology, Mary. I deserted you without excuse at Lanson on Christmas Eve. You can forgive me or not, but I can't give you a reason why you did it. I'm sorry. I blame you for nothing. Your business is your own. I was anxious for your safety. I traced you to the White Heart and I was told you had entered a carriage with some gentlemen. Beyond that, nothing. No word of explanation. Why are you locked in your room? My uncle does not care for eavesdroppers. He fears I might stumble upon his secrets. You appear to have the same dislike of intrusion. <sighs> to ask why you're here would be too much, I suppose. Don't be as bitter as you like. I deserve it. I know what you think of me. One day I may be able to explain if you're not outraged by that. I'm treading delicate ground, Mary, and one full step will finish me. Where is my brother? He told us he would spend the night in the kitchen. He's afraid of something, or someone. The windows and doors are barred. He's sitting there with his gun across his knees. I don't doubt he's afraid. He'll be more frightened still before many hours have passed, I can tell you that. I came here to see him. But if he sits there with a gun across his knee, I can postpone my visit till tomorrow when the shadows have gone. Tomorrow may be too late. What do you mean? He intends leaving Jamaica in at nightfall. Are you telling me the truth? Why should I lie to you now? And when you do see your brother, you best have a care for yourself. His mood is dangerous. Whoever interferes with his plans now risks his life. I tell you this for your own safety. I have no fear of Jars nor Everard. Perhaps not. But what if he is afraid of you? Where do you get those cuts and bruises in your face? Who did it? I got them on Christmas Eve. You were with him? Down on the shore. I had little choice in the matter. Oh, damn that black sauce of hell! At least I can get the window open now. Give me your hand! Oh, Mary. Oh, God, I might. You've got bruises all down your neck. I might have spared you this. How did it happen? 
They were crazy with drink. I don't think they knew what they were doing. I could no more have stood against them than a child. There are a dozen of them or more. And my uncle, he led them. He and Harry the peddler. If you know about it, why'd you ask me? Don't make me remember. How much have they hurt you? Bruises, scratches, you can see for yourself. I tried to escape and I bruised my side. They caught me again, of course. And they bowed my hands and feet and... Was my brother hurt you most? I've told you he was drunk. You know what he can do then. Oh, yes, I know. He should die for that. His death will not bring back the men he has killed. I'm not thinking of them now. If you're thinking of me, don't waste your sympathy. I can revenge myself in my own way. I've learnt one thing at least, to rely on myself. Oh, women of frail things, Mary, for all their courage. You're best out of this business now. The issue lies with me. <sighs> what do you intend to do? I have not made up my mind. If he leaves tomorrow night, you have little time to decide. He expects me to go with him, and Aunt Patience as well. And what will you do? That'll depend upon tomorrow. If I ask you to do something, how would you answer me? How can I tell? I want you to go away from here. I am. I'm going now. No, I mean away from the moors, away from Jamaica Inn. I want you to tell me you won't return again. I can stand up against your brother. I'm in no danger from him now. I don't want you to come here tomorrow. Please promise me you'll go away. Why? What have you got in your mind? Something which has no concern with you, but might bring you to danger. I can't say any more. I would rather you trusted me. Trust you? Oh, good God, of course I trust you. It's you who won't trust me, you damn little fool. Play your own game by yourself and leave me to play mine. If you want to be a boy, I can't stop you. But for the sake of your face, which I have kissed, keep away from danger. You don't want to kill yourself, do you? I have to leave you now, Mary. It'd be light within the hour. And if both our plans miscarry, what then? Would you mind if you never saw me again? <laughs> no. Of course you would not care. I have not said so. You hardly understand. Women think definitely the men. They travel separate paths. That's why I have no liking for them. I mean, for trouble and confusion. Well, it was pleasure enough taking you to Lansdon, Mary. But when it comes to life and death, like my business now, God knows I wish you a hundred miles away, or sitting with your sewing in your lap in a trim little parlour somewhere. That's never been my life, and never will. Why not? You'll wed a farmer one day, or a small tradesman, and live respectably among your neighbours. Don't tell them you once lived at Jamaica Inn and had love me to you by a horse thief. They'd shut their doors against you. Goodbye, Mary. Here's prosperity to you. Goodbye, Jim. Morning will soon be here, and a long day ahead. I must not draw suspicion on myself in any way. Make some excuse to rest in my room for a while, and then leave Jamaica in as Jem has just left it, by the window. Then run like a hare to Alternan. This time Francis Davy must understand and take action. And then what? And then back to the inn and trust that no one has noticed my absence. And then... Oh, how will Aunt Patience act when they come to take her husband from her? And will I see Jas Merlin with hands behind him, powerless for the first time and forever? What's the matter with you, girl? Why can't you sit still? Why are you fidgeting about all the time? It's just that the time passes so slowly. Uh, what time do you intend to leave Jamaica in, Uncle? When I'm prepared. And when I judge the time to be right. If we are to travel tonight, would it not be best if Aunt Patience and myself rested now, during the afternoon, and so could start fresh upon the journey? There'll be no sleep for any of us tonight. 
Aunt Patience has been on her feet since daybreak, and I have still not recovered from Christmas Eve. We do little good, as far as I can see, waiting here for the dusk to fall. You may rest if you will. I'll be working off for you both later. And you're right, there'll be no sleep for you tonight. Go to your room, then. I'll be well rid of you for the time. <laughs> Twelternum by the road is close on four miles. I can walk it in an hour. If I leave at four o'clock when it starts to grow dusk, then I can be back here again soon after six, and Jas will hardly come to rouse me before seven. If I climb out onto the porch, it's an easy drop to the ground. I can only pray that Jas doesn't take it into his head to change his plans. Four o'clock. I must waste no time to be gone now. Every second will be precious. <clears throat> oh, a fine evening. At least that's on my side. And later there'll be a moon to light the road for them when they come to take my uncle. Alternan. And all the old sounds and smells of a village. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten. Peace and safety, like home on Helford River. It all seems a thousand years away. <sighs> There's no lights at the vicarage, and no sign of anyone. Oh, blast you for a stupid fool, Mary Yellen. It's Sunday. Where would the vicar of Altonham be at this hour if not in the church? <gasps> uh, excuse me. Have you just come from the church? Oh, yes, I have. Why do you ask? Can you tell me if Mr. Davy is there? Oh, no, he's not. W were you wishing to see him? Very urgently. I can get no answer at the house. Can you help me? Well, I'm sorry. The vicar is from home. He went away today to preach at another parish. Oh, many miles from here. He's not expected back at Altonan tonight. But that's impossible. Surely you're mistaken. He left Altonan this afternoon. I ought to know. I keep house for him. <laughs> Oh, if there's any message you'd like me to give him when he does return... It'll be too late. This is a matter of life and death. Where's the nearest magistrate? Oh, there's no one close by. The nearest would be Squire Bassett over at North Hill, and that must be over four miles from here, maybe more. Oh, you surely would not walk there tonight. I must. There's nothing else for me to do. Oh, you must please yourself, but you'll best stay here and wait for the vicar if you can. That's impossible. But when he does return, can you tell him that... Wait, though. If you have pen and paper, I will write him a word of explanation. That'd be better still. Oh, there's pen and paper in my cottage. I'll see that he gets your note as soon as he returns. I came here to ask your help, but you were gone. By now, you must have heard with horror of the wreck upon the coast on Christmas Eve. It was my uncle's doing. He and the company from Jamaica Inn. That you will have guessed already. He plans to leave the inn tonight and cross the Tamar into Devon. Finding you absent, I go with all possible haste for Mr. Bassett to tell him, so that he can send at once to Jamaica Inn to seize my uncle before it's too late. In haste, Mary Yellen. There. Now, please can you tell me if the road to North Hill is hard to find? No, it's easy enough. You go two miles along the Lanston Road, and then you turn right by the turnpike and follow the path through Trebartha. Mm. But it's scarcely a walk for a maid like yourself after nightfall. This must be the manor house. A forbidding enough looking place. But there's a light at the back. What do you want? Hold your noise. Lie down. I have come to see Mr. Bassett on urgent business. It really is desperately important that I talk to him. You're out of luck. He left for Lanson this morning. And when is he expected back? He left word he'd not be returning till late tonight. What time is it? Oh, it is seven o'clock. Then it's too late. My uncle will be beaten at the door of my room. How can I hope to bring him to justice now? <laughs> 
In part three of Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, Mary Yellen was played by Susanna Corbett and Joss Merlin by John Woodbine. Aunt Patience, Oriel Smith, Jem Merlin, Mark Straker, Francis Davy, James Lawrenson, Harry the Peddler, John Hartley. Hannah, Davy's housekeeper, Catherine Parr, Scobell, the Bassett's servant, Eric Allen, the coachman, Brett Usher, the wreckers, Peter Gunn, Matthew Sim, and Robert Portal. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Jamaica Inn was dramatized for radio by Michael Bakewell and directed by Enid Williams. My uncle, Joss Merlin, had forced me to watch his gang of drunken wreckers take a ship on Christmas Eve. But this time he had set the whole country in a rage and had angered the mysterious master who gave him his orders. He was planning to escape justice by fleeing into Devon, but I was determined to prevent him. I slipped away from the house to warn the Reverend Francis Davy at Alternan, but he was away from home, and I set off across the moor again in search of the magistrate, Squire Bassett. We present Daphne du Maurier's Jamaica Inn. a long way across the moor to see Mr. Bassett. If I do not speak to him within the hour, something terrible will happen, and a great criminal will escape the hands of the law. If only there was someone I could talk to. Mrs. Bassett is at home. Perhaps she'll see you if your business is as urgent as you say. Will you follow me into the library? What is it, Scoble? Who is this young woman? She's come with great news for the squire, madam. I thought it best to bring her directly to you. What is this news you have for my husband? If I could speak to you alone for a few minutes, Mrs. Bassett. Uh, of course. Uh, that will be all, Scoble. Yes, madam. You look pale and worn out. Won't you sit down? Thank you. But I must know where Mr. Bassett is returning home. I have no idea. He was obliged to leave this morning at a moment's notice. And, to tell you the truth, I am seriously concerned about him. If this dreadful innkeeper shows fight, as he is certain to do, Mr. Bassett may be wounded in spite of the soldiers. What do you mean? The squire has suspected him for some time of terrible crimes. But it was not until this morning that the full proof came into his hands. He left at once for Lanston to summon help. He intends to surround the inn tonight with a large body of men and seize the inhabitants. You are the girl he spoke about. The girl from the inn. The niece of the landlord. Stay where you are. Don't move or I will summon the servants. I won't hurt you. Please do not ring. Let me explain. Yes, I am the girl from Jamaica. I Wind knew it. If you have come here to plead for your uncle, well, it is too late. You misunderstand me. The landlord of Jamaica Inn is a relative to me by marriage only. I fear and detest him, and with a good reason. I came here tonight to warn Mr. Bassett that the landlord intended to leave the inn tonight and so escape justice. <sighs> I have done a very senseless thing in coming here. My uncle will discover my room empty and will guess at once that I've betrayed him. He will leave Jamaica in before Mr. Bassett arrives. You speak sincerely and have an honest face. I am sorry if I misjudged you at first. You have been placed in a fearful position. And I think you very brave to come here tonight all those lonely miles to warn my husband. But there is nothing we can do now except wait until my husband returns. I shall ring for Scoble to bring you some supper. No, thank you. You're very kind. But I cannot sit here quiet by a warm fire while my aunt may be suffering the torments of hell. I must return to Jamaica Inn. I must know what's happening there. But you cannot possibly walk back there alone. I walked here. I can equally well walk past. Yes, but it'd be after midnight before you arrived. And heaven knows what might happen to you on the way. I am used to danger and the road by night. I won't hear of it. I will order the trap and Richards shall go with you. Now, he is most trustworthy and dependable, and I shall see to it that he is well armed. You shall set out without delay. 
That's the Palmer's Bridge of the Foy. Not far to go. A fine bright moon and the road running clear ahead of us. On a night like this, they'll easily hear us from the inn. We shall find the squire there before us, like as not, and the landlord with his hands tied, breathing fire and brimstone. Ah, it's a pity we were not here sooner. There'll have been some sport in taking him, I reckon. Little sport if Mr. Bassett finds that his bird has flown. We'll soon be in sight of the inn. Would it be best for you to wait here in the trap by the side of the road and I go forward to see if they're there? Better for me to go, and you follow a pace or two behind. Or stay here and wait until I call. Well, I don't know about that. There's the inn. There's no one there. Not a sign of life. The squire and his party have not yet come. Is Merlin within, do you think? If he is still there, I can risk an encounter with him where you could not. Give me a pistol. I shall have little to fear from him then. I hardly think it's safe for you to go alone. You might walk right into him. Oh, it's strange. It's as silent as the house of the dead. I fancy there'd be more wisdom if we'd turned down that track there and waited for them to come. I've waited long enough tonight and gone half mad with it. I'd rather come upon my uncle face to face than hide in a ditch, hearing and seeing nothing. It's my aunt I'm thinking of. She's as innocent as a child in all this business, and I want to care for her if I can. Give me a pistol and let me go in. I can tread like a cat, and I'll not run my head into a noose, I promise you. Here's the pistol, then, if you're so minded. You know how to use it? I know. Stay within call, but don't come after me unless I shout or give you some signal. But if I hear a shot? Then come in, but warily. There's no need for both of us to run like fools into danger. For my part, I believe my uncle to be halfway to Devon by now. The country will be well rid of him. Go you on in, then. I'll wait here. Not a sound. Not a lie anywhere. Oh, the windows and the door are still barred. The pony's still here. Then they've not gone, and Uncle is still at Jamaica Inn. He must have changed his plans. If he was intending to leave, he'd have gone long ago. Or has he gone off by himself on foot and left Aunt Patience here alone? No sign of life anywhere. <gasps> the kitchen door's been left unlocked. The ashes of the fire are still glowing in the hearth. Should I risk lighting a candle? Their bundles and blankets are still here. An uncle's gun is in its usual place against the wall. They must have decided to wait here for another day and gone upstairs to sleep. There's something strange. Something different. I've never known the house so silent before. The clock has stopped. Why has it stopped? It's lying on its side across the hall. And there's something by the side of it. Uncle Joss. There's blood between his shoulders. Oh, God. He's been stabbed. He must have dragged the clock down with him as he fell. And died there. Mr. Richards! What's happened? Is he in there? He's dead. Lying there on the floor of the passage. Here, let me wrap your cloak round you. Someone must have stabbed him in the back with a knife. The blood was all dry. He must have been there for some time. Any sign of anyone else? Nothing. What, was your aunt gone? I don't know. I couldn't go up the stairs. I had to come away. Here, get into the trap. Oh, you sit quiet for a while. That was no sight for a maid to see. You should have let me go. That's terrible for you to see him lying there murdered. They hadn't even finished getting their things together. There are bundles all over the place, waiting to be loaded onto the cart. 
It must have happened several hours ago. How did you get in? The kitchen door was unlocked. Did the man who killed Uncle have a key? Or did Uncle just let him in? Oh, it puzzles me what the squire is doing. He should have been here before this. I'd feel easier if he was here and you could tell your story to him. It's been bad work here tonight. You should never have come. I shall never go into that house again. Who would have killed him? He was a match for most men and should have held his own. Well, there was plenty, though, that might have had a hand in it. If ever a man was hated, he was. Something has happened to my aunt as well. I know that. I'm sure she is dead. That's why I was afraid to go upstairs. She's lying there in the darkness on the landing above. Whoever killed my uncle would have killed her too. She may have run out onto the moor. She may have run for help along the road. No, she would never have done that. She would have been there with him now, down in the hall there, crouching by his side. She is dead. I'm certain she's dead. If I had not left her, this would never have happened. I, I could go to the inn if you want and see if there's any sign there of your aunt. No, stay with me. I'll not be alone again. Think me a coward if you will, but I could not stand it. I can take no more tonight. Then if that's the case, perhaps we should go back to North Hill. I'll come here by the orders of the mistress, but she said the squire would be here. Seeing as he's... Uh, it's them! It's the squire coming at last! Uh, and he's brought the militia with him! Uh, you stay here. I'll tell him what's happened. Squire Bassett! Squire Bassett! Richard! What the devil are you doing here? The landlord is dead in sight there. Murdered. I have his niece with me here in the trap. It was Mrs. Bassett herself who sent me out here, sir. The young woman can tell you everything. If the fellow's been murdered, it serves him right. But I'd have rather clapped irons on him myself for all that. You can't pay scores against a dead man. Go into the yard, the rest of you. I'll see if I can get some sense out of the girl. Now, young woman... Tell me what you're doing here. Did Richards take you prisoner or what? I am here of my own free will. My uncle was planning to flee across the Tamar to Devon today, and I was determined he should not escape justice. I left the house without his notice and walked to Altonan, to the vicar of Francis Davy to warn him. But he was not home, so I walked across the moor to North Hill to find you. Your wife told me you were raising men to take my uncle. I couldn't stay there, not knowing what was happening. I had to come here. This is altogether beyond me. I believed you to be in conspiracy with your uncle against the law. Why did you lie to me? When I came to the inn earlier in the month, you told me you knew nothing. I lied because of my aunt. Whatever I said to you then was for her sake. Nor did I know as much then as I do now. But if I tried to tell you now, you would not understand. Nor have I time to listen. You did a brave thing walking all the way to North Hill, and I shall remember it in your favour. But all this trouble could have been avoided and the terrible crime of Christmas Eve prevented had you been frank with us before. I am willing to explain everything in a court of law should it be necessary. Well, we'll consider that later. Had you been a man, you should go with me now to the inn, but I'll spare you that. I can see that you've endured enough. Richards? Yes, Mr. Bowser. Take the trap up to the yard and stay beside it with the young woman while we break into the inn. I must ask you to wait in the yard, if your courage permits you. You are the only one among us who knows anything of the matter, and you were the last person to see your uncle alive. I will wait here. There'll be no need for you to break in. You'll find the kitchen door is open. Stay in the trap with Richards. I'll be back as soon as I can. I've been told that in the old days there was good cheer and company at Jamaica Inn, were friendly, happy folk living in the house, and always a bed for the passing traveller upon the road. The coaches stayed here then, what never do now, and the hounds would meet here once a week in Mr. Bassett's boyhood. Maybe those days will come again. I've only seen the evil. Over here. I've I seen the suffering the there's been and the cruelty and the pain. When my uncle came to Jamaica and he must have cast his shadow over the good things and they died. Here comes the squire. I'm sorry, but I have bad news for you. They found your aunt's body. Perhaps you expected it. Yes. Let's see what's going on, will you, Richards? Yes, Mr. Bassett. I don't think your aunt suffered at all. She must have died at once. She was lying just inside the bedroom at the end of the passage, stabbed, like your uncle. She could have known nothing. 
believe me, I am very sorry. I, I wish I could have spared you all this. They found the murderer, Mr. Bassett. They're bringing him here now. Don't take your hands off me. I know nothing, I tell you. Bring him close so that the lady can have a look at him. We found him in the barred room, lying in some sacks. He denies all knowledge of the crime. Do you know this man? I know him well enough. He's Harry the Peddler, and he came to the inn last night and quarrelled with my uncle. It was no quarrel of my making. My uncle locked him in the storeroom. He had every reason to kill uncle, and no one else could have done it. I never touched him. He's lying. But the door was locked on him. It took three of us to break it down. He'd been in the room all night. He couldn't have been the murderer. What did I tell you? I was lying there in the dark. And you heard nothing? Nothing but the rustling and squealing of the rats. He can be no use to us as a witness. But we'll have him in jail for all that. I haven't done anything. I'm innocent. And hang him too if he deserves it, which I'll be bound he does. I've done nothing. What am I supposed to have done? We should turn King's evidence and give us the names of his companions. One of them has killed the landlord for revenge. You may depend on that, and we'll track him down if we set every hound and cormorant on his heels. Take him away to the stables and hold him there. Sir, I know nothing about any of it. I swear to you, I'm a precious mother's name. It's got nothing to do with me. Hold your tongue or we'll string you up over the stable door. He shall die hold for this. Tongue. That's what Jem said last night. And the gypsy at Lanson first said that he would kill a man. She saw blood on his hands. The tainted Merlin blood. Someone's coming up the hill, Mr. Bassett. Who can have business on the road at this hour of night? And who would come to Jamaica Inn? Stop! In the name of the king, stop! I must ask you your business on the road tonight. Mr. Bassett of North Hill, I believe. The same. I had a message from Mary Yellen of Jamaica Inn asking for my help. But I can see I've come too late. You remember me, of course. We've met before. I am the vicar of Alton. And... You come upon an evil scene, Mr. Davy. Mary Yellen is here with me. Her uncle and her aunt have been murdered. I must speak to her. Oh, one of you take my horse. I will, Mr. Davy. This is grave news indeed. You must be worn out in body and soul, Miss Yellen, after such a terrible night. May I offer you the shelter of Alton? You are very kind. You need rest and sleep. You must try and forget all you've been through. It's behind you now and over. We'll find the man who killed your aunt very soon, and he shall hang at the next assizes. Go with Reverend Davy. Put this fearful place out of your mind. So, you're on your feet at last, Miss Yellen. It's growing dark. What time is it? Nearly four. I must have slept for 14 hours. Mr. Davy gave me a sleeping draught, I think. He told me what had happened up at Jamaica Inn. He said that I was to stay here until you were awake, in case you needed anything. That was very thoughtful of him. Is there anything I can get for you? No, nothing, thank you. Oh, then I'll be off back to my cottage. Mr. Davy shouldn't be too long now. He left a note for you on his desk. Will you tell him I've left supper on the kitchen table? Yes, I'll tell him. Ah. Oh, it's a terrible time you must have been through, my dear. You try to put it out of your thoughts now. I'll do my best. Goodbye, then. Goodbye. Thank you. Put it out of your thoughts. Thoughts won't bring Aunt Patience back. So it was, Jem, all along. He said my uncle would die for what he did to me. He was always the unknown factor from the very beginning when he first came to the bar in Jamaica Inn. But I deliberately shut my eyes to the truth and fell in love with him, like any foolish woman. But a word from me now, a message to Mr. Bassett, and Jem would die with a rope round his neck like his father before him, and Aunt Patience would be avenged. And yet I know that I could never give that word, never send that message. <laughs> Jem will ride away with a song on his lips, forgetful of my aunt and my uncle, and me. And I shall end up as a soured spinster, who was kissed once in her life and can't forget it. <laughs> Put it out of your thoughts. Why does Mr. Davy stack his paintings against the wall? If he doesn't want anyone to see them, why does he paint them? Mm, the moors beneath Brown Willie, with clouds banked up high on high like terrible giants, dwarf and everything else. The inside of a church. 
with a strange green afterglow lurking among the arches. I certainly wouldn't want to hang that on my wall. Does he see everything differently through those pale albino eyes of his? Is that why he turns his pictures to the wall, for fear that people might look into his soul? Uh, I'd better read the note you left for me. Dear Mary Ellen, I have been called to North Hill to arrange with Squire Bassett for the burial of your aunt and uncle there, and to discuss what further can be done to bring their murderer to justice. As to the rest, we can discuss that on my return. As to the rest, what can you mean by that? What does he propose to take a hand in my future? I can feel Francis Davy here in this room, as if he were watching me, as if his cold eyes were probing my soul. What kind of man is he? <laughs> Nothing anywhere here can help me find out. Would there be anything in his desk? Letters, or perhaps even a diary? Oh, shame on you, Mary Yellen. To pry into a man's private affairs. Nothing here, anyway. Except, except a drawing. Of a church with a vicar in his pulpit and the congregation in their pews. But they all have sheep's heads. And they're praying with their hooves. And the preacher has Francis Davies' white hair. But he's given himself the face of a wolf. A wolf laughing with his great white teeth at the flock beneath him. Oh. Mary Ellen, have I startled you? Forgive me. You did not expect me so soon and I have blundered into your dreams. No, I'm quite all right. Just a little drowsy after so much sleep. I have spent the day meddling in your affairs. But you asked for my help, did you not? I never thanked you for coming so promptly to Jamaica Inn. Nor for my bed last night and my sleep today. I marvel at your patience. It had not struck two when I bade you sleep early this morning and it is now seven in the evening. Long hours. And things do not stand still by themselves. Did you not sleep then, after I went to bed? I slept till eight. Then I breakfasted and was away again. My grey horse was lame and I could not use him, so progress was slow with the cob. He jogged like a snail to Jamaica Inn and from Jamaica Inn to North Hill. Did you see Squire Bassett? Oh, yes. He entertained us all to luncheon. There were eight or ten of us present. It was a lengthy meal and I was glad when we came to the end of it. Does Mr. Bassett suspect any one of the murders? Mr. Bassett is ready to suspect himself. He has questioned every inhabitant within a radius of 12 miles and the number of strange persons that were abroad last night is legion. But we will talk of this later. Have you eaten today? No. I have been awake only for a short time. Your housekeeper asked me to tell you that supper was in the kitchen. Then, if you do not mind, you shall lay the table and fetch the tray. I have letters to write and we will eat in an hour's time. Or, oh, after Mr. Bassett's generous luncheon, I shall probably watch you eat. What have they done with the peddler? They've not let him go. Oh, no. He is safe, under lock and key, screaming curses to the air. I do not care for the peddler. Neither, I think, do you. How do you mean? I gather from Mr. Bassett's groom that you suspected the peddler of the murder. Hence my conclusion that you do not care for him. It's a pity for all of us that the barred room proves him innocent. He would have made an excellent scapegoat and saved a great deal of trouble. Hmm. What did he do to incur your displeasure? He attacked me once. I thought as much. You resisted him, of course. I believe I hurt him. He did not touch me again. No, I suppose he did not. When did this happen? On Christmas Eve. After I sent you on in the coach? Yes. My uncle's men were waiting in the road. They shot the driver and seized the coach. And they took you with them to the shore to add to their sport? Please, Mr. Davy, do not ask me any more. I would rather not speak of that night, neither here nor in the future, nor ever again. There are some things that are best buried deep. 
You shall not speak of it, Mary Allen. I blame myself for having allowed you to continue on your journey alone. For looking at you now with your clear eyes and skin, the way you carry your head and, above all, the set of your chin, you bear little trace of what you endured. Uh, would you be so good as to pass the damsons? Of course. When I consider the peddler, I feel it very remiss of the murderer not to have looked into the barred room. It may have been that he was pressed for time, but a minute or two would hardly have affected the issue, and he would most certainly have made the whole affair more thorough. In what way, Mr. Dean? Why, by putting paid to the peddler's account. You mean he might have killed him too? Precisely. The peddler is no ornament to the world while he lives, and dead he would at least make food for worms. What is more, had this murderer known that the peddler had attacked you... He would have had a motive strong enough to kill twice over. I don't see what I have to do in the matter. You have too modest an opinion of yourself. Uh, the damsons are excellent. Will you not try some? No, thank you. To try and save his own skin, the peddler has turned to King's evidence, but he's not helped much. He's given us some of the names of his companions. The organization appears to be far larger than was hitherto supposed. In fact, he went so far as to suggest that the landlord of Jamaica Inn was their leader in name only, and that your uncle had his orders from one above him. Now, you can imagine what effect that had on Squire Bassett and his friends. They were very agitated as to who the leader could be. What have you to say of the peddler's theory? It is possible, of course. I believe you once made the same suggestion to me. I may have done. I forget. If that is so, it would seem that the unknown leader and the murderer must be one and the same person, don't you agree? Why, yes, I suppose so. Now that should narrow the field considerably. We may disregard the general rabble of the company and look for someone with a brain and a personality. Did you ever see such a person at Jamaica Inn? No, never. He must have gone to and fro in stealth, possibly in the silence of the night when you and your aunt were abed and asleep. He may have come on foot, so his horse would not have been heard on the road. I suppose that is possible. Uh, in which case, the man must know the moors locally, thereabouts. And that is why Mr. Bassett intends to question every inhabitant who lives within 12 miles of Jamaica Inn. So, you see, the net will close around the murderer, and if he tarries long, he will be caught. Mm. You've eaten very little, Mary Ellen. I'm not hungry. I'm sorry for that. Hannah will think her cold pie was not appreciated. Did I tell you? I saw an old acquaintance of yours today. No, you did not. I have no friends but yourself. Thank you, Mary Ellen. A very pretty compliment. But you're not being strictly truthful, you know. You have an acquaintance. You told me so yourself. I don't know who you mean, oh, Mr. David. come now. Did not the landlord's brother take you to Lanston Fair? The landlord's brother? I've not seen him since then. I believed him to be away. No, oh, he's been in the district since Christmas. He told me so himself. As a matter of fact, it had come to his ears that I'd given you shelter, and he came up to me with a message for you. Tell her how sorry I am. I presume he referred to your aunt. Was that all? Tell her how sorry I am. I believe you would have said more, but Mr. Bassett interrupted us. Mr. Bassett? M Mr. Bassett was there when he spoke to you? Oh, of course. We were all at his house. It was just before I came away from North Hill this evening when the discussion had closed for the day. And Jem Mernon was present at the discussion? Yes, he was there. Did... Did Mr. Bassett and the other gentlemen question him? Oh, yes. His answers were most astute. He must have a far better brain than his brother ever had. You told me he lived somewhat precariously, I remember. He stole horses, I believe. What will they do to him, Mr. Davy? What will they do to him? Do? Why should they do anything? I suppose he's made his peace with Mr. Bassett and has no more to fear. They will hardly throw old sins in his face after the service he has done them. I don't understand you. What service has he done them? Your mind works slowly tonight, Mary Ellen, and I appear to talk in riddles. Did you not know that it was Jem Merlin who informed against his brother? Jem? So Mr. Bassett gave me to understand. 
It appears that the squire fell in with your friend at Lanston on Christmas Eve and carried him off to North Hill as an experiment. He told Jem Merlin that he would clap him in jail on the morrow, but that he could go free if he would bring proof that his brother at Jamaica Inn was the leader of the wreckers. And what did he say? He asked for time to consider, and then, when that time was up, he told them to catch their man themselves. By then the news of the wrecking on Christmas Eve had come in, but he still would not change his mind. What made him change it, then? Ah, uh -huh. there's the mystery. I gather your friend slipped his chains and ran for it, but later he came back again, yesterday morning it would have been, and went straight up to the squire as he came out of church and said, cool as you please, very well, Mr. Bassett, you shall have your proof. Mr. Davy, I believe that I am the biggest fool that ever came out of Carmel. I believe you are, Mary Ellen. Whatever happens, I can face the future now, bravely and without shame. I'm glad of that. What else did Jem Merlin say? I wish I had the time to tell you, but it's nearly eight already. The hours go by too fast for both of us. I think we've already talked enough about Jem Merlin for the present. Tell me one thing. Was he at North Hill when you left? He was. In fact, it was his last remark that hurried me home. What did he say to you? Oh, he did not address himself to me. He announced his intention of riding over tonight to visit the blacksmith at Warleggan. Mr. Davy, you're playing with me. I most certainly am not. Warleggan is a long way from North Hill, but I dare say he can find his way in the dark. What has it got to do with you if he visits the blacksmith? What are you after, Jem Merlin? Are you wanting me to change the shoes on another horse you've thieved? I've come to show you a piece of your own bad workmanship. That's a new nail. Where'd you find it? Picked it up in the field below Jamaica Inn. Must have been cast last night. I want to know whose horse it was. Yesterday? Yesterday, Tom. Sunday. No blacksmith in Cornwall plies his trade on the Sabbath unless it's for a pretty important customer. He was on his way to Jamaica Inn. Who was it? Jamaica Inn? He'd never have gone on to Jamaica Inn. Why not, Tom? Because the traveller was the vicar of Altenham. You are pleased to be mysterious tonight, Mr. Davy. You lost your confidence in me today before I came. You went to my desk and found the drawing. You were disturbed. I saw the paper had been moved. You said to yourself, as you have done before, what manner of man is the vicar of Altenham? Ah, don't shrink from me, Mary Ellen. There is no longer any need for pretense between us, and we can be frank with one another, you and I. I am very sorry I went to your desk. Such an action was unforgivable, and I don't yet know how I came to do it. As for the drawing, I am ignorant of such things, and whether it be good or bad, I cannot say. Never mind if it be good or bad. The point was that it frightened you. Yes, Mr. Davy, it did. You said to yourself, this man is a freak of nature and his world is not my world. Were you right there, Mary Ellen. I live in the past, when men were not so humble as they are today. Long ago, in the beginning of time, when the rivers and sea were one, and the old gods walked the hills. What are you trying to say? I am a freak in nature, and a freak in time. I do not belong here. And I was born with a grudge against the age and a grudge against mankind. Peace is very hard to find in the 19th century. The silence is gone, even on the hills. Well, I thought to find it in the Christian church, but the dogma sickened me, and the whole foundation is built upon a fairy tale. Christ himself is a figurehead, a, a puppet thing created by man himself. Well, we can talk of these things later, when the heat and turmoil of pursuit is not upon us. We have all eternity before us. Of one thing, at least we have no traps or baggage, but can travel light as they travelled of old. I don't understand you, Mr. Davy. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, you understand me very well. You know by now that I killed the landlord of Jamaica Inn. And his wife, too. Nor would the peddler have lived had I known of his existence. You have pieced the story together in your mind while I talked to you just now. 
You were the man who gave my uncle his orders. The man he feared. He was like a child in a game, powerless without my instructions. A poor blushing bully that hardly knew his right hand from his left. His vanity was like a bond between us, and the greater his notoriety amongst his companions, the better he was pleased. No one knew the secret of our partnership. He served you well. You were the block, Mary Yellen, against which we stubbed our toes. With your wide, inquiring eyes and your gallant, inquisitive head, you came amongst us, and I knew that the end was near. Ah. Uh, in any case, we'd played the game to its limit, and the time had come to make an end. <laughs> How you pestered me with your courage and your conscience, and how I admired you for it. Of course, you must hear me in the empty guest room at the inn, and must creep down to the kitchen and see the rope upon the beam. And that, that was your first challenge. So it was you at Jamaica in that night. I'd almost come to think I'd imagined it. And then you steal out upon the moor after your uncle who had a tryst with me on Rautor and losing him in the darkness stumble upon myself and make me your confidant. Well, I became your friend, did I not? And gave you good advice. Did my uncle know of our meeting? He knew nothing, nor would he have understood. He brought his own death on himself by disobedience. I knew something of your determination, and that you would betray him at the first excuse. I trusted that he would give you none. I told him to lie low. I thought that time would quieten your suspicions. Your advice had little effect. He had to drink himself out of his mind and set the whole country in a blaze on Christmas Eve. I knew then that he'd betrayed himself, and with a rope around his neck he would play his last card and name me master. Therefore, he had to die, Mary Ellen, and your aunt who was his shadow. And had you been at Jamaica Inn last night when I passed by, you too... No. You would not have died. You would have come with me then, as you will tonight. You are wrong. You would have killed me then, as you will kill me now. I am not coming with you, Mr. Oh, Davy. You prefer death to dishonor? I face you with no such problem. You have proved yourself a brave opponent, and I prefer you by my side. That is a tribute. You are young, and you have a certain grace which I would hate to destroy. In time, we will take up the threads of our friendship, which has gone astray tonight. You are right to treat me like a child and a fool. Any friendship we may have shared was a mockery and a dishonor. And you gave me counsel with the blood of an innocent man scarce dry upon your hands. My uncle at least was honest, drunk or sober. He blurted his crimes to the four winds and dreamt them by night to his terror. But you, you wear the garments of a priest of God to shield you from suspicion. You hide behind the cross. You talk to me of friendship. <laughs> your revolt and your disgust please me the more, Mary Ellen. There's a dash of fire about you that the women of old possessed. Oh, your companionship is not a thing to be cast aside. Come, leave religion out of the discussion. When you know me better, we will return to it. I have had my soul sickened. We must delay no longer. Take your cloak. No, I cannot. Understand me. The house is empty, and the pitiful vulgarity of screams would be heard by no one. I'm stronger than you would suppose. A poor white ferret looks frail enough and misleads you, doesn't he? But your uncle knew my strength. I don't want to hurt you, Mary Ellen, or spoil that trace of beauty you possess for the sake of silence. But that I shall have to do if you withstand me. Come. Where is that spirit of adventure which you have made your own? Where is your courage and your gallantry? Very well, Mr. Davy. I'll come with you. But you'll find me a thorn in your flesh and a stone in your path. You will live to regret my company. Come as an enemy or friend. That does not matter to me. You shall be the millstone round my neck, and I'll like you the better for it. 
You'll soon cast aside all your poor trappings of civilization that you sucked into your system as a child. I'll teach you how to live, Mary Ellen, as men and women have not lived for 4,000 years or more. You'll find me no companion on your road, Mr. Davy. Roads? Who spoke of roads? We go by the moors and the hills and tread granite and heather as the druids did before us. We shall make sorry speed, I'm afraid. My cob has been worked hard today, and there's scarcely been an opportunity to replace the Grey's horseshoe nail since he cast it outside Jamaica Inn. He betrayed me. I must carry a woman on his back as penance. Clouds cover the moon. The gods are smiling on us. How do you find your way? I know every stone of the moors, every track and every stream. Here, I am like a blind man in his home. We shall go straight into the great black heart of the moor, Mary, where no one shall follow us. You're out of your mind, Merlin. He's a man of the cloth. He wouldn't be the first parson who's tried his hand at smuggling. But he's a respected member of the community. He was one of the men I summoned to Lanson to find out how best to put an end to the wreckers. Isn't that just the kind of man you're looking for? Someone who could pass unsuspected anywhere, who could easily have intelligence of shipping on the coast, and who lives with an easy access of Jamaica Ann. That's true. And you can't deny the evidence of the horseshoe nail. Then we'll ride to Altonen and confront him with it. Where are we bound? For the north. For the sea, where we shall take a ship that will carry us far from Cornwall. So we're to leave England, Mr. Davy. After today, the vicar of Altonen must cast himself adrift from Holy Church and become a fugitive. You shall see Spain, Mary, and Africa, and learn something of the sun. You shall feel desert sand under your feet, if you will. I care little where we go. You shall make the choice. <laughs> Why do you laugh and shake your head? Because everything you say is fantastic and impossible. You know as well as I do that I shall run from you at the first chance, and at the first village, perhaps. I came with you tonight because you would have killed me otherwise. But in daylight, within sight and sound of men and women, how can you hope to hold me? You forget that the north coast of Cornwall bears no relation to the south. You won't find pleasant lanes and cottages like your home in Helford. The north coast is as lonely and untravelled as the moors themselves, and never a man's face shall you look upon but mine until we come to the haven that I have in mind. Let me grant, then, that we reach the sea and take a ship. Name any country you please, Africa or Spain. And do you think that I should follow you there and not expose you as a murderer of men? <laughs> you will have forgotten it by then, Mary. Forget that you killed my mother's sister. Yes, and more besides. Forgotten the Moors and Jamaica Inn. Forgotten your tears on the high road from Lanston and the young man that caused them. You are pleased to be personal, Mr. Davy. I am pleased to have touched you upon the raw. Oh... Don't bite your lip and frown. I told you before, I have heard confessions in my day, and I know the dreams of women. There, I have the advantage of the landlord's brother. Your horses seem to be treading uneasily. They're afraid, and no wonder. There are marshes all around us, and no solid treading. I can smell the reeds. They're sour and rotten. I can't see a yard in front of us. Fog. A great bank of fog coming at us out of the night. The gods have gone against me after all. I know these fogs of old and this one will not lift for several hours. To continue now through the marshes would be worse madness than to return. We must wait for the dawn. Here? In this stinking marsh? No. Not here. We'll move away from the low ground. There will be rest for you after all, Mary Ellen. And a cave for your shelter... And granite for your bed. Tomorrow may bring the world to you again, but tonight you shall sleep on Rautor. Get on! This is my kingdom. Here we are far away from the sordid world below us. Alone in the silence with only the peaks of granite to shield us. You should try to sleep and get what rest you can. I'll not sleep. Why not? We shall sit here and wait for the dawn. 
It's barely midnight now. There are long hours to wait. Give way to sleep, Mary. And let go. Do you think I want to harm you? I think nothing. But I cannot sleep. You're chilled. Crouched there in your cloak with a stone behind your head. I'm a little better myself. We would do well if we gave our warmth to one another. No. I'm not cold. I understand something of the night. The coldest hours come before the dawn. You are unwise to sit alone. Come and lean against me, back to back, and sleep then, if you will. No. I have neither the mind nor the desire to touch you. No, I'd rather stay here alone. As you wish. off from sleep much longer. The winds whisper and whisper like a thousand voices through the stones. And the stones seem to be turning to men. Their faces are older than time and their hands and feet are carved like the claws of a bird. to do this, Mary, for both our sakes. And now, I'm going to gag you with my handkerchief. No! Now, when we set forth last night upon this expedition, I reckoned without the mist. If I lose now, it will be because of it. Listen, and you will understand why I have bound you and why your silence may save us yet. You know what that sound is, Mary? It is bloodhounds following our scent. I heard once, and I had forgotten it, that the squire of North Hill kept bloodhounds in his kennels. It is a pity for us both, Mary, that I did not remember. Come, Mary. Friend or enemy, we share a common danger now. We must go higher up the tour. <coughs> Climb up onto the great stones. The stones of the gods, Mary. They may still protect us. Come on. Up here. Can't you climb any further? I'll cut you loose. Save yourself then, if you can. I'm going to climb to the top of the tallest stones. There'll be no more smuggling at Jamaica Inn now. I'll sweep the place clean of all those cobwebs, and not a poacher nor a gypsy will dare show his face within the walls when I've done with it. I'll put an honest fellow in there who's never smelled brandy in his life, and he shall wear an apron round his waist and write, Welcome, above the door. And do you know who shall call on him first? Why, you and I, Mary. <laughs> you and I. <laughs> You must make up your mind what you're going to do now, Mary, seeing that you're your own woman again. You're too young to live alone, that's for certain. And I'll tell you to your face, 
You're too pretty. There's a home for you here at North Hill, you know that. Why don't you stay here with us, Mary? We'd love to have you in the house. The children adore you. We would give you a carefree time with no worries or cares. Plenty to do, of course. Flowers to be cut, letters to write, children to scold. And you would be a companion to me when Mr. Bassett is away. I must admit, I'm sorely tempted. But it isn't what you want. Do you still fret after your home in Elford? I'm hungry for the smell of a farm, the cows and the smoke from the chimney. I want to hear the hens and geese again. I want to get up early in the mornings and draw water from the well. Oh, I'm sure we could manage something of that sort here. <laughs> I need to think things through. Decide what I really want. If you'll both excuse me, I'm going to go for a walk on the moors to let my mind roam free, now that there's nothing to trouble it. It's strange, but Kilmartor seems to have lost its menace now. It just looks like an ordinary black scarred hill. But the moors are bleak still. The hills friendless as they ever were. But their old malevolence is gone. Someone's moving out and taking all their goods and chattels with them. It's loaded down with pots and pans and chairs and mattresses. Mary! Mary Ellen! It's Jim. And to think it never crossed my mind. I didn't expect to see you out in the moors. I heard you were sick. And I've taken to your bed. You must have heard wrong. I've been about the house over at North Hill. I'm walking in the grounds. Well, there's never been much the matter with me, except a hatred for the neighbourhood. There was a rumour that you would have settled there and be a companion to Mrs Bassett. I suppose that's more like the truth. You lead a soft enough life with them, I dare say. No doubt they're kindly people when you know them. They've been kinder to me than anyone else in Carmel since my mother died. But I'm not staying at North Hill for all that. So, where are you be gone? Back to Helford. And what do you do there? I shall try and start the farm again. Or at least work my way towards it, for I haven't the money yet. But I've friends there that'll help me in the beginning. Where will you live then? There's not a cottage in the village I couldn't call home if I wanted to. We're neighbourly in the south, you know. Oh, I've never had neighbours, so I cannot contradict you. But I've always had a feeling that it'd be like living in a box to live in a village. You poke your nose over your gate into another man's garden, and if his potatoes are any larger than your own, there's talking upon it and an argument. <laughs> and you know that if you cook a rabbit for your supper, your neighbour will have the sniff of it in his kitchen. Oh, God damn it, Mary, that's no life for anyone. And where are you off to with all your pots and pans? Well, you've got a hatred for my neighbourhood, same as you. I want to get away from the smell of peat and bog. And the sight of Kilmar yonder with his ugly face frowning upon me from dawn till dusk. Here's my home, Mary. All I've ever had of it, here in this cart. And I'll take it with me and set it up wherever it pleases me. There's no peace in wandering, Jim, and no quiet. There'll come a time when you want your own plot of ground and somewhere to lay your tired bones. The whole country belongs to me, Mary, if it comes to that. With the sky for a roof and the earth for a bed. <laughs> you don't understand. You're a woman, and your home is your kingdom, and all the little familiar things are day to day. I've never lived like that, and never shall. I'll sleep in the hills one night, and in the city the next. I like to seek my fortune here and there and everywhere, with strangers for company and passers by for friends. We speak a different language, you and I. Which way will you go? Well, somewhere east of Tamar, doesn't matter to me. I'll never come west again, not until I'm old and grey and forgotten a lot of things. I thought of striking north after Gunners Lake and making for the Midlands. Oh, they're rich up there and ahead of everyone. There'll be a fortune there for a man who goes to find it. Perhaps I'll have money in my pockets one day and buy horses for pleasure instead of stealing them. It's an ugly black country in the Midlands. Well, I don't bother about the colour of the soil. Marlon peat is black, isn't it? And so is the rain when it falls in your pigsties at Halford. What's the difference? You're talking for argument's sake, Jim. There's no sense in what you're saying. <laughs> How can I be sensible when you lean against my horse, with your wild, daft hair entangled in his mane? And I know that in five or ten minutes' time I shall be over the hill yonder without you, my face turned towards the Tamar, and you walking back to North Hill to drink tea with Squire Bassett. You don't belong there, Mary. I know that, and I'm going back to Helford because of it. I'm homesick, Jim. I want to smell the river again and to walk in my own country. Go on, then. Turn your back on me and start walking now. 
You're very harsh today, Jim, and cruel. I'm harsh to my horses when they're obstinate. But it doesn't mean I love them any the less. You've never loved anything in your life. I have no much use to the word, that's why. Well, it's past noon already, and I ought to be on the road. I've havered here long enough. If you're a man, I'd ask you to come with me. And you'd fling your legs over the seat and stick your hands in your pockets and rub shoulders me as far as it pleased you. I'd do that if you'd take me south. Yes. But I'm bound north and you're not a man. You're only a woman, as you'd find out your cast if you came with me. I'm going now. Goodbye. When you're an old maid in Mettons down at Helford, you remember that kiss. And it'll have to last you until the end of your days. He stole horses, you'll say to yourself, and he didn't care for women. But for my pride, I'd be with him now. It's not pride. You know that it's not pride. There's a sickness in my heart for home and for all the things I've lost. That's it, then. <clears throat> Wait! Hold him still! Give me a hand. Help me up. What now? <laughs> and where do you want me to take you? You have your back to Alfred, you know that. Yes, I know. If you come with me, it'll be a hard life and a wild one at times, Mary, with no biding anywhere and little rest and comfort. You get poor exchange for your farm and small prospect of the peace you crave. I'll take the risk, Jem, and chance your moods. Do you love me, Mary? I believe so, Jim. Better than Halford? I can answer that. Why are you sitting beside me, then? Because I want to. Because I must. Because now, and forevermore, this is where I long to be. In part four of Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier, Mary Yellen was played by Susanna Corbett and Francis Davy by James Lawrenson. Jem Merlin, Mark Straker, Squire Bassett, Vincent Brimble, Mrs. Bassett, Anne Jameson, Harry the Peddler, John Hartley, Richards, Sean Arnold, Hannah, Davy's housekeeper, Catherine Parr, Scobell, the Bassett's servant, Eric Allen, the blacksmith, Robert Portal, the militiaman, Matthew Sim. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by Tim Sturgeon, Wilfredo Acosta and Colin Guthrie. Jamaica Inn was dramatised for radio by Michael Bakewell and directed by Enid Williams.